Are we live? We're going live. Oh, wow. Somehow on Twitch, I said that we're going live, but I didn't type that. Yeah, it was you. <laughs> it was, it, it was, but it wasn't. Was that a Blair? Uh-huh. Somebody <laughs> has the keys to the car. The keys, <laughs> yes. Someone is gaining power and it's fantastic. Welcome everyone to the live broadcast of the taping of the This Week in Science podcast. Thank you for joining us once again. We have a great show lined up tonight. And just remember, there's going to be snipping and cutting and editing and the final podcast will it will be a little different from this but this is all real unedited live you never know what's gonna happen on the live show i don't know just want to let you know that so thank you for being here live are we ready to get going yes we're nodding everybody's nodding we're ready to go that means that i can take over this screen and i can say starting in three two this is twist this week in science episode number 843 recorded on wednesday september 22nd 2021 how metal is science Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show we will fill your heads with smoke, salt, and metal. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Here you are, the most advanced, most evolved, most genetically diverse, not to mention the oldest and most populous life form the planet has ever known. And perhaps, as you listen to this, you are covering the earlobe of a human ape. Or perhaps you are on a houseplant near the window. You could be hovering in the air, riding on a particle of dust, or even just be at rest upon the speaker that is producing this sound. But wherever you are, remember, this world would not be alive without microbes like you. To do all the little things that need to be done, those tiny tasks you carry out while going about your day make everything else possible. Yes, Occasionally, a few of your friends wind up in places where they may not be so welcome, but you will always have a home pretty much anywhere you choose to, in the water and in the soil, within the niches and on the surface, beneath the bottom of the ocean floor and high aloft the upper atmosphere, on the skin and in the guts of every living creature, and as always, right here on This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about science because that's what we do this week and every week on Wednesdays or whenever it is that you happen to download us to listen. <sighs> we are here with another great show lined up. It's been a fantastic week, and tonight I have stories about tiny robots, hot biofuel, and smoke. Lots of smoke. The, the, the air quality is really bad. We're going to talk about that. And we have an interview. Dr. Michael D.L. Johnson is joining us to discuss his very metal science. Thanks for joining us tonight, Michael. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you here. Justin, what do you have for us? I have got cooking with lasers. Uh, I have got, ooh, high sodium diet that uh, kills cancer. That, 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 and mice. Uh, <laughs> dark <laughs> energy. <laughs> dark energy uh, may have been discovered, and we are just discovering now that we may have already discovered it. As we... well as uh, some autistic sex stories. Oh, all right. Yeah. These all sound very intriguing. Blair. Yes. How's the animal corner looking? 
Oh, well, so just for fun, I brought a quick story about touchy-feely joysticks. Um, but then in the animal corner, I have uh, deceiving moths. But really, forget all that. I'm here tonight to talk about seahorse placentas. All right. We are waiting for you to serve those up for us. Yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, I love the animal corner for all that it brings. <laughs> You never know what we're going to get. You know it'll be strange. I think that's the guarantee. <laughs> you know it's going to be wonderful. All right. If you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, remember you can find us all places where you can search for This Week in Science. We are on Facebook. We are on YouTube. We are on Twitch as Twist Science. We are on Twitter as Twist Science, and we're on Instagram as Twist Science. We're on all the podcast platforms, and our website is twist.org. But now it's time for the science. So since it is Climate Week, I wanted to get started with a quick overview of what's going on and how things are looking out there in our climatically changing world. Apparently, the smoke that is... Uh, or has been released by wildfire, wildfires in California this year, has released particulate matter and carbon dioxide, specifically carbon dioxide, at a level more than has been released by India in a year. Massive amounts, gigatons, gigatons of carbon dioxide have been taken from forests that have burned and been put into the atmosphere. This is data from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. They found that wildfires in July emitted nearly 1.3 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And this is more, this was topped in August. 1.4 gigatons, woohoo! August was way better. But this is more than all of India's carbon emissions in a single year. So these are ma majorly wildfires in California, Oregon, but also Siberia has its place in there. Uh, we're looking at some old stands of wood, carbon sinks that are being turned into carbon sources. And this is going to be a big issue moving forward. But in those lines, we also have the World Health Organization warning that pollution needs to be reduced and they are setting new levels for standards for air pollution to protect human health, which is a really needed thing. We need to protect human health because we know that air pollution is one of the things that also is a precondition for certain diseases like COVID-19. And this week, UN, UN officials are meeting during this climate week in New York City at the UN general meeting. And there is some good news that's come out of it. China has vowed to stop building new coal power plants. They're not going to build mm. any more as of the end of this year. So that's pretty big news. That's great. I mean, with the wildfires and then all this other news too, it's, it's a good reminder that, yes, wildfires contribute to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and climate change, but they're also exacerbated by climate change. So they're, they're part of a feedback loop, but also we can try to not make future wildfires more common and worse by reducing our carbon emissions from things like coal power plants. So I also yeah, would appreciate, oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I would appreciate if they would use units other than yearly India carbon output, because I really don't know what that is. I mean, maybe yeah. that's gigatons. Maybe the amount. Nobody knows I, what a I gigaton need, is either. You I can't don't quantify gigaton, that's, that's a too gigaton. many tons. I need it in like some like American city, like like uh, the amount of, uh, you know, it's five times the yearly output of the traffic from uh, Columbus, Ohio. OK, well, there's right. at least, you know, how they it's like the, the way they measure the break offs of, of icebergs in number of Rhode Islands that it amounts to. <laughs> yeah. Wait, Fair point. I, mean, I think I think with, with one that... thing and use it every time. Yeah. But, but think, the people in Europe could say the same thing. I don't know what Cincinnati gets up to. I, yeah, that's true. I don't either. <laughs> but at least if it, was, if it was every time, I'd know yeah. it was more Cincinnati's this thing than than that one. I don't, I don't think I've heard them use the Indias before. I still think anytime you say the word gigaton, um, 
that, I think that's universally understood as a lot. Yes, and, that's a little, little, whole lot, yeah. yeah the, the smoke has been crazy because um, there were actually people on the East Coast that were starting to smell the smoke. And I mean, it, it's just crazy that there's that much smoke that can just travel across the country. Like, you know, it went on a trip like we did. It was just crazy. We, I passed it when I was in the plane on, uh, on the way back from North Carolina. We actually didn't smell it. But as soon as we, you know, left, they were like, it's all smoky around here. And it was like, well, there's no fires. Well, that's literally from the east. Uh, that's literally from the west coast. Right. And I was like, it just broke my brain. It's, it was all coming from Oregon, Washington, California, just being sent across the country. You're welcome. <laughs> We're all You're welcome. We didn't manage our forests well. Yeah. Hopefully we will do so in the future. Well, hopefully the East Coast won't send their storms to us. I don't want that. So yeah. Oh, yeah, we know we need yeah. the rain. Are you kidding me? I, we, we, oh, rain. we don't need those catastrophic storms. We are. <laughs> we don't have the infrastructure for that. Those Do once in a lifetime, fight. once a year storms. Yes. <laughs> we don't need those. We we get our, our what are they? The the Pacific rivers that come that come mm -hmm. through and just drop all of the rain on us. But anyway, enough of the negativity. We're positive. It's good if China can stick to its promises and stop building coal power plants and manage its power output and its power production it stands a good chance of reducing its carbon dioxide output, which is growing rapidly right now. So there's a lot. We could all we could all do our part. And currently as well, there are a couple of bills in Congress that are looking at money for sustainable energy and really developing some sustainable energy pipelines to make it work better. But enough about energy. What else do we need? We need food. Justin, tell me about 3D printing it? Yeah, so that might become a thing. You, you come home, you take your tube of food stuff, you put it in the food processor, you hit the button on the menu, whatever you want, and then a little while later, you've got your tasty meal. It's not quite here. They've been working on this for a while, uh, but we're still a little ways off from, from actually getting a, a tabletop version of that we can put in the kitchen. One of the hurdles has been, how do you cook a thing that's just sort of been layer by layer formulated into a foodstuff looking thing? And so some of the engineers at Columbia University did that thing that engineers like to do, and they came up with a solution for the thing. And they, of course, had to use lasers because what better solution is there? Uh, can, can, can we use lasers to cook our food? No, they're, they're using lasers to make food. They're using lasers to cook the food after the three. So, okay, what they did is right. they bought, they like bought store bought chicken, put it into a food processor, and then stuck it into the syringes of their 3D printer. Just like McDonald's. Yeah. Just like, just <laughs> like food. everything else we eat. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then, yeah, so this thing's printing out uh, a three millimeter thick layer by layer. Uh, and as it's getting put down, they hit it with lasers. They follow around, boo, just did the scan thing with lasers. And they found, uh, they used three different wavelengths. This is all sort of what's sort of unique about this. They used different wavelengths of the laser on this period chicken as it was applied. Uh, the blue light, they used blue laser, a near infrared, a mid infrared, uh, and uh, on this chicken. The near to mid infrared layers apparently provided the best surface level browning and broiling, while the blue lasers accomplished more penetrative cooking. They found uh, the 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 laser cooked meat had fifty percent less shrinkage. It retained double the moisture content. Maybe that's part of the less shrinkage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it shows similar flavor development to conventionally cooked meat. They claim, and I, I'm saying they claim as opposed to they discovered, just because I'm highly skeptical of uh, <laughs> the claim, that participants in the taste test of their lab cooked chicken actually preferred that cooked on the printer. Which, you know, either means the printer is really amazing right off the bat here, or that the engineers were just terrible at cooking 
the regular chicken that they use yeah. as a comparable. There you go. Yeah, that you know, like what is the it. comparison? Yeah. Right. Also, did they look and ta- and like feel the same? They can't have. No, no, no they can't. Right. So that you'd can't. know. You'd be like, oh, cool. This is the three D printed meat. Let me try. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's going to be some excitement bias from those who are excited about the possibilities of the technology potentially. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless it's a blind taste test somehow. But I mean, you but definitely did. It was fine. <laughs> what was that? I was just say there has to be a texture difference. You, I mean, like you you have to know which one you're eating at a particular time, right? Yeah, I, I would yeah. think so. Yeah, I mean, it's not gonna, it's not gonna have the texture the same, right? Basically, with like a, a, a solid piece of chicken versus. A, but here's the thing: Would you be willing to give up? What What would you be willing to give up with it when, and we call it food still and eat it still, if it could be made by itself? If you didn't have to do any cooking, like it's sort of like how frozen food and then microwaving became. Like sometimes that's just a convenient thing. It's not the same. Your grandmother never would have fed that to you. But but this is like, yeah, it's quick, it's easy. I'll have the robot cook dinner. And then you know, for, for something like you can store by the chicken, you can put it in the fridge, you can throw it in the, not too hard. Not too hard, much of a difference in setting up this dang robot. But if we get into the cricket uh, diet one day, maybe nice. people will prefer the cricket protein tube to go into the machine to get printed out to taste mm-hmm. like whatever. Yeah. Versus, you know, catching crickets across your kitchen counter, trying to get them into the pot. Absolutely. <laughs> cricket goo versus might... chicken goo. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if these blue lasers are going to replace the microwave in the common kitchen. So here's how long things, did it though. take, Justin? How long did it take to make that thing? So I, you know, that's one thing they're not talking about. I think, it, I think time-wise, it's probably not a time saver. Yeah. I, at, at this point, <laughs> probably took like eight hours. That's how long it takes to three D print plastic, uh, right? They're, yeah, they're sort of more like no, no, no. I think it took like the regular amount of time for the okay. cooking wood for a chicken. But uh, what they are talking about is like you can make interesting patterns uh, in the things that you cook because they're engineers. They're like, look, you can make designs on the food that you're eating. Who cares? That's called toddlers are going to be thrilled. We already yeah. have dino nuggets. It's fine. Yeah. right. Or can you imagine going to a fancy restaurant and they put 3D print chicken onto a plate saying, will you marry me? Oh my and God, right yeah. underneath, there's a ring there. <laughs> she said, no, I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And possibly the 7,000 7, layer cake. Yes, love man twitch. Yes, I would say yes if it was a cake. <laughs> and not chicken. <laughs> <laughs> things that things that weren't looked at, yeah, that need to be looked at in the future. Uh, methods to reduce cross contamination between cooked and raw printed layers. The effects mm. of food cooling rates on lethality. Lethality. You gotta make sure you gotta reduce the lethality of your food. Folks. I'm surprised they went from <laughs> go with with a food that is notorious for making people sick. Right. Yeah. Salmonella. It's no joke. Uh, yeah. There was a couple e. reasons I guess they chose that as the base, um, but that uh, they wanted to use a, a meat, I guess, yeah. a, a meat product. Um, also, Justin, I did find the triangular prints that we're looking at right now took eight minutes, eight minutes. and oh, the gosh, squares took nine to ten Ooh. minutes. Okay, well, that's so actually, definitely well, that's some efficiency bad. that needs to be addressed. Here. Is that is that that's not too bad though? Is no. it if you were putting nine minutes on a pan? You'd be like, okay, that's that's reasonable. Yeah. Uh, they they also did this with, uh, I think, I guess one sort of laser that was shooting that was changing frequency between these infrared and this uh, blue laser. It was all the same laser that was changing. They uh, that's one of the things they want to look at in the future is they can have uh, simultaneous multi wavelength lasers at the same time. All uh, so that might speed it up. Uh, essentially is what they're thinking maybe if they have multiple lasers pew, 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 shooting at the <laughs> three millimeter layer of uh, and we, we laugh because this is have more lasers we laugh because this is ridiculous 
that's why we're laughing at it. But, uh, you know, the future mm -hmm. is always more ridiculous, as we've seen. It just gets progressively more ridiculous. So this, I am assuming this will be a thing. Mm -hmm. And these new really methods like, have to be tried. Yeah. I actually really liked your idea about using more insect protein for mm -hmm. this particular mechanism. Yeah. I think that's because you could basically have a little bit more sustainable of a supply source without the salmonella. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and you know, even for veggie goods, like, uh, yeah. you know, just having, having, if it can make interesting meals, if it's self spicing the thing, like I would try it. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think there's something weird about the idea of using chicken for it. It's something that does seem like it could go really wrong yeah. really fast. Yeah. Especially too, yeah. like this, you know, the other thing, sorry, last thing about it is, this also has like this, I fear in the back of my head, like uh, the juicer. The juicer is an amazing thing. And it's like so easy to use. You just take uh, carrots and you put it in the thing and it's like, ah, and it's done. But then at the end, you usually end up with a machine that's impossible to clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, how do you clean syringes that had chicken goo? Or whatever going through. Like you have to be throwing out. Throw it away. Yeah. yeah. Hydraulics. Mm -hmm. High pressure pushing water through so the water bleach solution. It's 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 gonna be a whole it's gonna have to be a whole to shoot out of that directly. And then yeah. something will have to happen. Yeah. But there's gonna be a bunch of disposable stuff at the end of it. So. It's it's gonna be disposable stuff, and we're gonna end up with, you know, you're gonna be missing the soft serve chicken machine at the Dairy Queen because they they haven't cleaned it property properly. So. Oh boy. <laughs> oh man. Sorry. Just don't get the swirl. Whatever you do, oh, don't get God. the swirl. So would you get like gravy on top instead of sprinkles? Yes. <laughs> Some parsley. Right. Oh, okay, Blair, take us into another 3D printing story. Yes. Something so... not so edible. No, but it's very touchy feely. Right. Uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology has developed a new method to 3D print mechanisms that can detect how force is being applied to it. What does that mean? It means that it is a 3D printed interactive input device, like a joystick, a switch, or a handheld controller, and it can be just printed all at once ready to go. They integrate electrodes into structures made from metamaterials, which are materials divided into a grid of repeating cells. And they, um, to test it, they created an, a special editing software um, that helps them build interactive devices with this new technology. So this, these 3D printed structures are capable of integrating the sensing directly into the material and structure of the object. So you don't have to wire it. You don't have to make all these individual moving parts. You just kind of like press on something and it knows that you're pressing on it. And so this has the opportunity to enable new intelligent environments in which objects, objects can sense your interaction with them. So this is where it gets really crazy. For instance, a chair or a couch that's made from smart material could detect your body when you sit on it. And you could use it to query particular functions like turning on a light or a TV or to collect data for later analysis, like correcting or detecting body postures so this is where it gets kind of dystopian i think potentially <laughs> your chairs could interact with you and sense the way that you're sitting and have oh, no. you gained weight um so anyway uh or, the... worse, or worse it's tied into advertising uh, and it can tell you're you're, you're uh -huh. slouching and it's like hey try these purchase ideas 100 <laughs> oh. yes absolutely yeah, and so these grids of cells that were 3D printed, when a user applies a force to them, uh, some of the cells are have flexible I interiors, and so they can stretch or compress. And so that's how they can kind of figure that out. And then so they have these conductive shear cells that um, have two opposing walls, and they're made out of conductive filaments. And then there are two walls that are non-conductive, and so uh, they basically work like electrodes. So in, in the case of their demonstration, they created a metamaterial joystick with four conductive shear cells embedded around a base of a handle in each direction, up, down, left, and right. And as the user moved the joystick, the distance area between opposing conductive wall changes so that the, detect, uh, the direction and magnitude of applied force 
can be sensed. That is fancy schmancy speak for they used it to play Pac-Man. <laughs> oh. So they successfully <laughs> used this thing to play Pac-Man. And so, uh, yeah, this is like a crazy breakthrough in 3D printing technology. And I can't wait to see what happens. That's amazing. I can't. Yeah. The potential, like you mentioned here, there, there, there are sci-fi stories about those couches that sense your body and then fit a couch based on your size based mm -hmm. on how you are and, and they and they react to you they react to your temperature they react you know, so sci-fi has been thinking about all these things and imagine a couch that can tell whether or not you're too hot whether mm -hmm. or not the chemicals also that are emanating from your skin are potentially you know maybe there's something wrong with you they're monitoring your health your your gaming your favorite gaming chair is also or, uh, a doctor's chair. Yeah, <laughs> you don't your need a just goes, you just you know, need your gamer chair. Maybe, maybe you should lay off the video games you are developing carpal tunnel. I can tell by the yes. tensor strength <laughs> of your hand. Or a couch you take just a tells you it's it's time to get off the couch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can it sense weight as well? Like it could sense different weight as well. So mm -hmm. if, in theory, would be able to sense if I put down an empty chip bag beside me on the couch. Yes. And yes. then this is a you full would chip get into bag. those whole advertisements of, mm -hmm. you know, oh, maybe I do need some more Doritos. What you do is you have your plate that your 3D printed chicken is on is made out of this material. <laughs> and then it can sense when you're running low on your 3D printed chicken. You put it down, it plops out more. There you go. The future. Also. The future is so amazing to imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think this is going to be a thing. I think this is really, this is going to change things in the future. Yeah, I think both of these 3D printing stories are. I think mm -hmm. it is hinting at the usefulness of 3D printing, where 3D printing, yes, hobbyists have been able to create, you know, knickknacks and doodads and pr create plastic figurines or little structures that enable them to do particular jobs, print little tools. They've got metal 3D printing up on the International Space Station. So they're and they're going to start using recycling so that they can print things and use them and then put them back into the system so that they have a constant supply of, of things that they need. But this makes it interactive. This makes it something that is like re it's this is this is taking 3D printing in a whole new direction. And that I yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. And with, it, with, cool. with what they did with it here, it looks like it'd be a great toy for a kid. And I, I don't say that to, mm -hmm. you know, demean it in any, any way, shape or form, but it's one of those things that could really get somebody interested in science. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the more of those things we have, the better. Yeah. 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 That and what a, what, what a great way to uh, sort of field test uh, the durability. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> Put it in the hands of kids and see how badly they can tear it up in a, in a mm -hmm. year. I want to see this. I want to see the plans for this up on Adafruit very soon where you can, you know, get your Raspberry Pi board that you can program with your own video game. You can 3D print your own joystick that is going to sense what you want it to do. You can yes. connect all the pieces together. I mean, this is where the maker and science really start coming together and connecting and actually i left that completely out of the story because i didn't even think it was relevant but the 3d uh print cooker thing that they were working with the lasers they ran it all with the raspberry pi nice they, they're doing everything off of yeah just that's uh, great i yeah. love that it's the best it is it's off the shelf technology at this point there was there you know we have these Devices are smartphones that can be like black boxes if you don't know about all the technology that goes into them. But there are ways now to make things, to create things, and all these, all these components, they're all available for building and making, and it's so cool. Okay. This is This Week in Science. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. If you really are enjoying it, share it with a friend right now. Tell somebody about it. Get them to listen with you. 
We have our guest tonight, Dr. Michael D.L. Johnson. Dr. Johnson is an assistant professor in the Department of Immun Immunobiology and the Bio5 Institute at the University of Arizona. His lab is studying how certain metals can be used to kill bacteria. And this is really important because we know antibiotic resistance is on the rise. And so it's important to understand what other tools we have in our toolbox. How can we live with, defeat our bacterial nemeses? <laughs> Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for meeting us and joining us for the show tonight. Yeah, it's, it's been great so far. And I look forward to uh, sharing what we do a little bit more. To get into what you do, I'd love to start at the beginning, or maybe not the very, very beginning, but how did you, you were a music major as an undergraduate. How did you go from majoring in music to killing bacteria? Well, that is, so I'll actually go ahead and tell you the real story because I, I, it's, it's one that's, uh, I guess, has been a defining feature in my particular career. Uh, it was a fantastic weekend My uh, right after my senior year finals, uh, at least first semester finals at, uh, when I was an undergrad. Uh, that weekend, I actually spilled the beans to my then girlfriend that I had intentions in marrying her. Uh, we've been married for over 16 years now. Mm -hmm. And I also found out what I was going to do. And, you, you know, another disclaimer, as Justin said at the beginning, you might find me crazy for this one. Uh, but at least you'll know where my heart is. So, um, you know, I, I was, you know, doing what you do, you know, you, you, you do things with the, uh, with the girlfriend and you try and get in good with her parents and her parents are great. I actually really love hanging out with them. Um, so we actually went to. It's good church. to say when you're on a podcast. <laughs> oh no, they, they know, they, they know, <laughs> but yeah, um, there's, there's no hiding anything here. Um, but um, I actually went to uh, I went to uh, church with them and I it was like during praise and worship. And all of a sudden I heard the word pharmacology. And I can tell you that no praise and worship Christian song has the word pharmacology. In it. So I'm like looking around like, did I just really <laughs> hear what I thought I heard? Like, you know, and the, 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 the sermon seemed to kind of like actually match me going into that, you know, like change. It's like, are you sure? Like, I'm a music major. Are you sure you want? Okay, okay, you're right. Okay, fine. That I, I'll, I'll go into doing that. And you know, at this point, I'm borderline thinking that I'm crazy, but it kind of still all made sense and fit. So, um, like I said, you can call me crazy. You can call, you know, you can say it was divine intervention. You could say whatever you want to say about it, but that's my version of the events. And I started to pursue going into science and. Uh, if you can imagine, it's really difficult getting a science position uh, as a music major. I mean, yeah. I could compose you a symphony, but I can't hold a pipette, but I can learn. Um, yeah. So I had to. So after like doing all of that, trying to um, trying to apply to almost 200 jobs and getting denied left and right, I sent my CV. I just went to different HR departments and said, look, I'm looking for a job please help me. And I, I went to uh, UNC Chapel Hill uh, and uh, in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And all of a sudden I got a phone call from a guy named Jeff Grellinger, who was the chair of microbiology and immunology. So I went and got a suit because I'm like, this is the interview. This is going to be, you know, my, my big moment to get a job in science, which will launch my career. Um, and I, you know, I, I show up and I go over to the, uh, the lab manager. I say, I guess I'm a little overdressed from the lab. Just trying to make a joke, bad joke conversation. Um, I do the interview and get a, a call back uh, three weeks later saying I got the job. And he's like, you know, in true Jeff fashion, who, who was uh, my mentor at that time, he said, I didn't hire you because you were the most qualified for this job. You think I'm a music major? I, I got that. You didn't have to tell me that. I mean, it was really understood. But he's like, I hired you because you had like personality. You talked to the lab manager. And I'm like, did I get hired on a really dumb joke? But I'll take it. So ever <laughs> since then, um, things start falling into place. Uh, you know, I, I did my, uh, I, I was a technician in his laboratory for two years, uh, working on immunology, uh, looking at 
uh, T-cell responses uh, and looking at innate immune responses to a bacteria called Francisella tularensis, also known as rabbit fever. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I went to graduate school, uh, got my degree in biochemistry, biophysics. Uh, so yeah, from music to biochemistry, biophysics, it was, uh, uh, I was- It's a little jump. Just a little, little. Little, little bit, a little bit, very smooth, smooth transition. Um, Before and, we move on to the science, I have to ask, sure. What was your instrument of choice? So my instrument of choice was trumpet. trumpet. So I love playing the trumpet. Uh, but if I had to, if you said you could do, you know, only a few things in music, it would have probably been music composition and music theory. Those were, those were my favorite. I love to compose different songs or arrange things. I did things for orchestras, for uh, singing groups, for marching bands. It was just, it was just fun. Nice. Do you still play? I do not, unfortunately. I, I, you know, it's one of those things where you have kids, you have science, you have like all these things, and it's just it gets hard to do. Uh, it gets hard to do everything, but it doesn't mm -hmm. make me miss it less. But um, I don't regret the choices. I, I think that you know what I'm doing now is right exactly where I need to be. Now you're writing symphonies of science. Yes. I am. Yes. There you go. You're composing experiments. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best. And, you know, luckily uh, I have a really good uh, team in my laboratory that uh, helps drive some of those decisions and some of those projects. Nice. That's great. So how did you, so you, you, you were studying bacteria. You were starting to investigate through the biophysics and biochemistry, looking at, um, looking at the immune system and interactions with bacteria. And wh at what point did you go, okay, we're going to focus on the metals and, and what metals are doing? The, the moment that happened was actually when I was in graduate school where I studied a protein called pill Y1. And, you know, we have names for all of these particular proteins that um, sometimes don't make a lick of sense, but that's what this one is called. What this protein did in particular is it was basically um, controlling something called pillus extension retraction. So bacteria have these arm-like grappling hooks that they can use to kind of move along on a different surface. Think of it as an army crawl, uh, and it kind of helps them uh, move on, uh, move around, or actually sense their environment. Uh, and they also use it to attach to surfaces. So this protein, pill Y1, controlled when that pillus was out and that pillus was in. So it controlled motility, it controlled attachment, and it did so in the bacteria called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is uh, really well known as a, uh, an opportunistic pathogen in people with cystic fibrosis, people with, uh, who are burn victims. And even more direct in this huge protein of, uh, you know, what actually controlled whether or not that pillus was extended or retraction was a singular calcium ion. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. Like one calcium, you know, and I actually made this meme back uh, when I was in graduate school. One, you know, I had like the Lord of the Rings uh, 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 wording <laughs> under the crystal structure saying one metal to rule them all, right? And it's just really fascinating how, you know, when, when calcium was in, the pillars was out. When calcium was out, the pillars was in. And it basically caused this flux and all, it controlled so many things that, were necessary for that bacteria to do literally, you know, almost everything it needed to do first before even colonize. Like if you can't attach as a bacteria, you're just going to be coughed out. So it was the it was the initial you know point that that bacteria made contact with the host, and it was controlled by calcium. And I like I said, I thought that was one of the coolest things ever. And I said, well, what else can we find out about metals? And I sought to find out different laboratories to. Uh, to show me. And so when I went to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, they said, hey, we got this project about copper. And I'm like, I don't know that much about copper, but sure. And um, sure enough, I fell in love with working with it. And, you know, it's just, it's an amazing metal uh, that, that we use quite often, but, you know, a lot of pathogenic bacteria don't really like. And, you know, that's something that we can use to our advantage. Yeah. I'm just thinking about, you know, metal toxicity is something that's you know, common people will talk about um, having to take chelators to sop up the metal that is building up in their body because one of their organs isn't working properly or whatever. Um, and so 
is that kind of what you're looking at in the bacteria? Do do they <clears throat> get metal toxicity? Is that is that what happens? That is exactly what happens with them. So one of the things you need to know about metals is the way that they bind to different active sites to, you know, because, you know, things kind of put together. And metal binding is actually quite promiscuous. So, you know, if you look at things like on that row on the periodic table, iron, you have manganese, you have calcium, you have uh, cobalt, nickel, uh, copper, and then zinc. Um, hopefully I said that in order, otherwise I might lose my PhD. Um, but what they do is they can actually bind to different active sites, but there's one metal, you know, it, it is kind of an order of stability in which they do that. Uh, so copper is actually very stable in a lot of those particular binding environments, and that can be great for us. We use copper in proteins that work for metabolism, uh, you know, there's, you know, proteins in the blood that have uh, copper as well. Um, but for bacteria, what ends up happening is those metals get into those enzymes and it essentially locks them up for, for the bacteria. So hmm. when excess metal comes in like copper, that's what causes some of that toxicity. Now, this is just one of the mechanisms of copper toxicity. Uh, there are plenty of others. Um, but that actually does cause that particular toxicity that you're talking. They get intoxicated. They try and get rid of it. They have these export systems. But by and large, when our bodies actually try and use copper to kill bacteria, we can still overcome their uh, their defenses. How do we do that? How do we overcome their defenses? What are you doing? <laughs> so one of my favorite cells in the host is called the macrophage. The macrophage is the garbage collector. The macrophage um, can phagocytose or eat bacteria or other uh, in invaders. And when it eats that particular bacteria, what it does is it makes this specialized ball of death. And that ball of death is actually called a phagolysosome. It's when the phagosome mixes with the lysosome, and it's, I call it the, the ball of death. <laughs> in that ball of death, it lowers the pH where acidic conditions make things less hospitable. It increases the oxidative burst, which, you know, people always talk about free radicals are bad, and it does that with the, uh, with the bacteria as, uh, uh, as well. But it also does something called nutritional immunity. Now, we mentioned earlier that, you know, metals are actually still necessary. Bacteria need iron. They like manganese. They like some of these other metals like calcium that I mentioned earlier. Um, but the host, by and large, knows that and says, well, we're going to sequester all of those metals. We're going to try and take those away. And it says, well, we know you actually don't like things like copper, so now we're going to start bombarding you with copper. So all of that is happening in concert with the lower pH, with the oxidative burst, and it becomes too much for bacteria to, be to bear, and they die in that phagolysosome. And then the macrophage says, okay, what else is there to eat? And it goes and actually buys some more things. So that's exactly what happens. Uh, so yeah, right in that phagolysosome area, um, that's where the magic happens uh, inside, of the, uh, inside of the host. So you know, that's one of the ways that our body takes advantage of copper toxicity uh, with particular bacteria. But I mean, we've been using copper for a lot of things. So since antiquity, people actually stored food in copper pots to make sure their things didn't spoil. There's actually something called the Bordeaux mixture, which is copper and lye. You can spray it on uh, on vineyards to help save uh, wine crops. Uh, you can sp spray that same co uh, compound on potatoes uh, to help save against the potato blight. So if you like wine and you like French fries, you're a copper fan right now. Congratulations, Team Copper. Um, <laughs> and if, uh, But you can also use it on surfaces or as tools inside of a hospital to cut down on hospital-acquired infections by up to 70%. And if copper is like has all these awesome properties, we should know how it works. And we're still trying to figure that out. Um, so that's actually one of the things my laboratory is trying to address. How is copper toxic? What do the bacteria do to overcome that toxicity? And then the subject of what the paper was is can we weaponize this to kill, uh, to kill not only uh, pathogenic bacteria, but maybe fungi and other things as well. Yeah, so you've been looking specifically at the strep Streptococcus pneumoniae bacteria, which is known for all sorts of diseases and 
nastiness. Um, do you expect that the mechanisms that you're finding out about within the strep bacteria, if is that going to be applicable? So that's one of the things that we really hope will happen here. So, you know, we found a compound that can actually work with copper to kill the bacteria. So if you add copper, that can be bad. But if you add the compound, maybe not so bad. If you add them together, it rips the bacteria to shreds. So one of the things that we have to do is empirically test that compound or that combination against other pathogens to see if it actually works. But one of the ways that we're trying to use this particular compound is to say, well, let's see if we can make it a Goldilocks situation. And I, I like to use lots of analogies. So let's say we have a compound that binds copper really, really tightly that's actually going to be protective. That's actually going to be beneficial to the microbe because it'll suck up all the excess copper and that's actually good for it. What if you have something that binds it very lightly? And what that does, well, the bacteria has these export systems and it can still just kind of overcome that. But if you have something that's just right, something that can hold on to it long enough for it to get inside of the bacteria and release it into one of those enzymes that and causing that enzyme to break, and again, since it's promiscuous, it's not just a singular target, there's multiple targets uh, that it actually can poison inside of the bacteria, then you're on to something. So what we're trying to do now is say, okay, can we play with those Goldilocks range for different organisms to see if we can find one that will work for Streptococcus pneumoniae, one that will work for now Strep um, um, pyogenes, which is a causative agent of Strep throat. Um, can we find one that works for staph? What about gram negatives? Can we have it work for Pseudomonas aeruginosa? Can we have it work for fungi? And we actually have had our compound work for fungi. There's this endemic fungal pathogen called uh, Coxidioides imitis, also known as valley fever. Uh, and it actually works against that. And we're super excited about that because there aren't too many cures for that. Um, or yeah. uh, so, you know, so we're, we're, we're trying to play with some of these variables, very, you know, various conditions to see if we can, you know, almost come with a library and, you know, be able to predict this compound should work, this compound and co uh, cocktail should work against this pathogen and this co uh, compound cocktail can work against uh, this other one. We're still far way away from that, but uh, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You got to start so... with the 3D printed chicken first, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Start with the 3D printed chicken and then solve antibacterial resistance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that's a big deal, though, because we are yeah. getting so resistant. Uh, I mean, that well, we're not. The bacteria are getting resistant. <laughs> the, the things yeah. that we've thrown at them in the past, we're sort of selecting for a super robust uh, next uh, a current wave of bacteria that our antibiotics are working on less and less and less. And people forget. People forget because it was so long ago that bacteria killed more people than anything else. Just infections was like a leading cause of death in the world for forever. You, you, and this is, a, you cut your, the paper cut. Could be lethal. Could be <laughs> lethal. If you got the infection, no. that could just be it. And and we we kind of wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be afraid of any of that. We put on a little Neosporin, you know, at the worst case, we'd have to go and do an antibiotic treatment if we got a really bad infection. But, but we take it for granted that the science and medicine have already figured that out and it works forever. And it, it's getting overcome by more and more bacteria. So we need these, these additional tools out there to, to save off the next, the next hundred years of antibacterial existence. The, the estimates currently are by 2050 that mm -hmm. uh, antibiotic resistance deaths will out, uh, outnumber cancer deaths. Yeah. So that's the current prediction. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a crazy number. And then you complex that with the antibiotic resistance is going up, but the uh, production of antimicrobials that is being invested in is actually going down because it's just literally getting harder and harder because you make this antibiotic that targets this one drug, uh, this one protein inside of a bacteria. And then all of a sudden the bacteria says, well, I'm just going to change how I use that protein. And now your drug doesn't work anymore. So one of the things that we like about this particular, um, uh, at least this approach, is that copper can basically mismetallate or poison multiple different targets. 
which makes it a little bit more difficult for the bacteria to adapt or uh, a, a way around that. And if it can adapt a way around that, then uh, hopefully we don't ever see that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it, it yeah, if there are multiple targets, maybe it can adapt away from one of them or maybe even a couple of them, but getting away from all of them is going to be that much more difficult. So, yeah. That is our hope. Well, that's and the, that's a great approach. Yeah. And the thing is too, I'm sure if you go into a copper mine, there's bacteria in there that have learned to somehow metabolize or utilize copper, right? So, so the thing is, though, then, then, then maybe the focus of you've you've actually changed the thing that the that the bacteria is even interested in in devouring or being involved with. Like, if if it really can resist copper, then it's probably got to be metabolizing it in some way, and therefore it's probably doing something completely different than the thing did in the first place when it was uh, trying to be eradicated and, and utilizing copper or whatever the whatever metal is being utilized to, to move it on down the evolutionary path to bothering something other than us. So there are actually there, I mean, so there are a lot of microbes that do utilize different metals um, and, you know, can clean up metals that are actually toxic to us. There's environmental or oceanic uh, bacteria that can and do use copper often. And, you know, if you actually look in uh, some farms where people use copper washes for their boots, if you look in, you know, the soil there by the copper wash, you're still going to find some bacteria. So what we're hopeful about this is that those bacteria will never, ever speak to the ones that are actually harmful to us. Um, right. Inevitably, they probably will. But uh, hopefully we're, you know, millennia away from that particular point, And this can, you know, work uh, for a while until we find the next best thing. Um, but, you know, absolutely, there are bacteria that do utilize those metals. It's just that at the, I guess, the host pathogen interface with uh, with those particular bacteria, those by and large are not friends of copper. And that's good for us. Right. The ones that are down in the bottom of the mines, eating the copper, living next to the copper happily, they're not the ones that are infecting us and causing disease. So. Yeah, hopefully the horizontal gene transfer doesn't happen. We don't have to worry about them swapping their genes and turning into bigger problems. But in the meantime, this is this is a great strategy. And so along with this, would, would the, the, the targeting effort that you're making, would it be used in conjunction with antibacterials that we currently have? Would it be like, oh, you're going to take amoxicillin and this copper treatment? Or is it a standalone that would that you that you foresee working all on its own? Or do you have any idea? So I, I would definitely say it wouldn't be a standalone. I think that it's one of those things that if you can give the, you know, the host a competitive advantage to kill those bacteria, why wouldn't you do that? And one of the things that we're trying to do now is understand excuse me, what the mechanism of how this compound works. Like, how is it exactly is it poisoning the bug? What is it doing to the bacteria that is causing, you know, such problems? And if we can do that, then perhaps we can actually predict with an which antibiotic to pair it to so that we can actually you know, give really a, you know, nice knockout blow. So instead of jab, jab, it's uppercut, uppercut. Um, and that's really what, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do here. You know, I, I don't think there's, you know, I think there are lots of seats at the table to try to eliminate certain pathogens and, you know, trying to say that this is the only way and it'll be my way or the highway, which mm. it's just, I don't know, that that's, that would be a weird take. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor, and by the way, we take. have, we have for sale at the end of this uh, interview, Dr. Justin's, not a real doctor, copper tincture for what ails you. <laughs> one out of one researcher who we quoted said, why wouldn't you? On on that note, actually, though, I uh, I read a, a New York Times article about you uh, from a while back that you had been getting letters, emails from people trying to use copper to oh, either yeah. prevent COVID infection or to treat COVID infections. Um, hmm. Can you talk Not a little bit about some of, the, some of the misunderstandings and, you know, what what was understood and what wasn't? And Absolutely. So there was a study that came out talking about, 
how viable COVID um, um, viral particles are uh, on different surfaces. So they looked at you know, cardboard. And that was that one thing. It's like, well, leave your packages, you know, don't touch them for a couple of days. So right. everybody was, everybody was bleaching oh, their yeah. groceries. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, you spray, you know use the Clorox wipe yeah. for your luggage when you kind of go somewhere. Um, but one, by and large, when they did that study, the, uh, the surface that COVID did not survive on very well was copper. So as soon as that happened, I got lots of calls. It's like, oh, you're the copper guy, right? I'm like, but I'm not a virologist and I'm not a materials chemist, but you're the copper guy, right? Oh, uh -huh. okay, okay. So if I have this copper phone case, right? Uh, will that actually protect me from COVID? No. If I eat this copper, please don't eat straight copper, please. And I feel like with so many things that people are taking these days, let me repeat very clearly, please don't eat straight copper. Um, can you can you can you lick copper? Is that it? <laughs> there was some old wives' tales about uh, sucking on a penny before 1982, and it actually had more copper in it, uh, and that was kind of a way to uh, to beat whatever ails you. But you really, know, that, See, that cop old, that pen it, the yeah, old like wives but know it, what they're talking about. <laughs> There are actually some zinc sprays that people, you know, actually do use, and they have actually literature-based evidence to work, unlike sucking on a penny um, or just consuming straight copper, or you know, nor do the copper bracelets work. I mean, there's just, yeah, it, it became uh, a lot of. Hey, can, we have this product. Can you? I'm like, no, no, I, I can't. I'm sorry. It just no. Uh, but. I probably could have made a lot of money, yeah. um, but I don't know if I could have uh, lived with myself, maybe, you know, while I was sitting on the beach crying with my pile of money, wiping my tears with a hundred dollar bill, um, that, you know, I, I would have eventually felt guilty. Yeah, yeah, it's not. I'm it's so not glad that you didn't do that, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> and now and now you're here. Are people? Yeah, I, I, I do hope that people don't decide from this to try and that they listen to you no eating copper but our copper doorknobs our copper tabletops are the things that are copper in our environment they're nicely antibacterial yeah and they look pretty and they look pretty. yeah and the thing is what, what i'll also i'll also preface that by saying or, or at least uh, comment on that by saying there's a lot of surfaces that have that keep that kind of reddish brown copper look those are actually also treated surfaces, which means that when you're putting your hand on it, it's not quite on the copper that's underneath. Uh, if you want to talk about a surface that's actually made of copper and is not sealed at all, um, the Statue of Liberty, and you can see it oxidizes over time and it turns that bluish green. It's actually, you know, copper underneath that. Um, well, that is copper. It's just the oxidized version of that copper. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, so, you know, Copper is a great accessory. It looks really cool, but uh, I would not count on it to save you from all that ails you. Hmm. At Hand least not washing. until we figure it out. Hand washing, mm -hmm. sanitation, it's, it's, it works pretty well. Pretty exactly. good. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the eventual outcome of all of this, you've got the, the study that you've published where you're, you know, you're, working on creating the the this multi-pronged attack you're like getting in there trying to really target these things what what do you hope with this will be the eventual outcome are you going to follow it to to market or are you going to do a pivot and look at other basic science questions after you've kind of figured out the mechanistic as aspect aspects of how it all works I would say a little bit of both. Um, I think this is this project has been really wonderful in that by studying this compound and what it's actually doing with copper with the bacteria, we're really learning a lot of extra, you know, basic science things about bacterial uh, physiology, but, you know, and then working with bacterial genetics to really kind of really fundamentally understand some questions on how bacteria process metals in general. And that's, I mean, if you want to look at, you know, science, you know, there's basic science questions, there's like kind of the biomedical realm, and then there's like the translational part where you're trying to make, you know, something that goes right to clinic. And I think that 
they coexist. And this project is a great example of that. Um, do we want this product to go to market? Do we want it? Absolutely. It was funny. I, I actually talked to, uh, you know, our university has this thing called Tech Launch. And they helped me, you know, as far as like funding to make some derivatives of the compounds that we're finding to see if they work against different things. And they do, which is also really, really cool. Um, they helped me file for the patent for this. Uh, and, you know, they got me in front of some people and the people were like, well, what's your business plan? I'm like, that's why I'm here asking y'all. I can tell y'all about the science, but the business plan, I'm, I'm, it's like, I want to cure things. You know, like, I, don't, <laughs> I um, want to save lives. Yeah, that's, that's my <laughs> business plan. I, I want to save lives. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, and I think that's why I got into this. I didn't really, you know, I don't think really too many professors get into it to, to you know, to like say, I'm going to be rich being a scientist. I mean, if you want to be an inventor, yeah, you can do that. But like, you know, you know, to, that's that that was not my passion. Uh, and, you know, and based on the story of how I got into science in the first place that I told you earlier, that was that really wasn't something that I saw as my mission. It was really to make science accessible. It was really to help as many people as I could and just, you know, you know, just honor the craft, if you will. So it's really nice to kind of be on kind of a couple sides of that to do, uh, you know, to basically have, you know, people helping me say, well, let's get this to market. Uh, and I know there's plenty of steps in front of me, you know, to, to do that. And so many things fail along the way, but, yeah. you know, you have to put them in the pipeline to be able to try. But then I, again, I also have the basic science part of that where I'm just really making fundamental, you know, bacterial discoveries, which is uh, really just a lot of fun. I love that. On the research side of things and also the the working with other people and lifting people up, uh, you've also been involved in developing a program for uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, in the NSERP program. And I was wondering how many people, so this is something that was started during COVID-19 to allow students to get research experience even when labs were shut down. So how has that gone and how many students have, have you been working with and is it going to keep going after this is after, hopefully we, we can get to go back to work again for real? Yeah. So, you know, in the middle of both, I guess, a racial pandemic and a public health pandemic, my heart was heavy. Mm. It, and it, this, I needed to do something to help somebody to kind of channel that negative energy. And I had an idea on, you know, I re always remember the dates, June 3rd of uh, last year. And I, you know, told a buddy, I'm like, let's see if we can, you know, give some people an opportunity. And in 11 days, we put together a website bylaws and said, this is the program that we're going to have. So we opened it up on, uh, you know, and within a week, we said, well, if we get 25 mentors to match to 25 mentees, we were basically like a matchmaking service, like swipe right for research kind of thing. That's what we were trying to to really do. Um, and we said to the community, if you're, if you say that you're an ally, then here's an opportunity to be an ally. And the response was overwhelming last year. Uh, last year, we had 250 students uh, matched to over 170 mentors on a virtual uh, research project. And I did not know that Gmail had an email limit of how, far, <laughs> how many you could send, send per day. Holy yeah. moly, so many emails, but we 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 made it work. Um, and you can if you, you know you can go that project and presentations, and you can see all the projects that people actually had last year. And you know, people ask me, are you gonna run it back this year? And you know, you can actually click those links and see some of the virtual projects that people did. Uh, this is the, the ones that you're looking at now are for this year. Uh, so we actually this year got some funding from not only U of A, we had some funding from uh, NSF. Um, yeah, so you can, you know, like basically lots of people were giving talks. We added captions so people could, you know, uh, be uh, be included there. Uh, but this year uh, we got some funding from the National Science Foundation to actually be able to not only have the program, but pay students for full time uh, research. And one of the reasons why this is really important is because COVID, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, one day will go away. But when we asked ask the question to some of the students in our program, we said, look, um, 
independent of COVID, would you have been able to travel to go to a, uh, a summer research program? And 33% of them said no. And an additional 25% said, I'm not sure. And the reasons for those are um, family obligations. They have to take care of loved ones. They might have a health, uh, something that's going on, um, you know, just inaccessibility to get somewhere, transportation. So we said, this program's not going to be for them. We're going to make sure that we meet people where they are. And I think that that's one of the things that's lost in science so much is that accessibility point. And, you know, we had these students that were hungry, willing, really, really eager to participate, do some great science. And, you know, the, the mentors had some great research pro uh, projects for them. So this year we had uh, 66 mentors uh, or 66 uh, mentees to uh, 64 uh, mentors. And all of them were paid full time for the eight week uh, program, um, at, uh, living wage. Uh, we, ha we, ha we had it uh, 15 uh, bucks per hour for that. Uh, some of them were coming to science for the first time. Some of them had never touched a pipette before, but uh, we had them coding, learning different like, how to read microbiomes and compare all this stuff. And, you know, it was really great. We also had a professional development course for them uh, for some other, you know, BIPOC and uh, uh, Latinx speakers speak to them on their science and also professional development, things like research and responsibility and conduct. Uh, we had the other thing as far as meeting people where they were, we had people who were afraid to sign up because they didn't have a computer that worked. They mm. were, they couldn't sign up because they didn't have a webcam. So yeah. we bought them computers. We bought them webcams. Fantastic. And we hope to goodness that the grant that I just put into the NSF gets funded so that we can run this program back for the next three years. Um, and then we'll, you know, I think this template of virtual research can work. It's, I think in person is always going to be, you know, great. That interaction is going to be fantastic. But for those who don't have that opportunity, we can meet them where they are and we can have this virtual program for them and they can succeed and they can, you know, get experience. And this can be the launching pad for their particular careers. We got some great stories about people getting accepted to some great graduate schools going to comp national conferences and getting awards that they, you know, the, of projects that they did during this particular summers. Um, so this is, you know, this is, uh, to me, it's just an, as important as finding that compound that kills bacteria, because it's something that is, you know, really giving back is something that's really close to my heart. And I, like I said, I, I can't tell you how much working with this program did to me and meant to me as far as just kind of lifting my spirits in a, uh, uh, in a scenario, uh, you know, of, of well, to say, lack of better words, a, 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 a period of suckage. I mean, like, it, <laughs> you know, it's been it really pretty was. crappy, like, you know, yeah. um, but, you know, this is one of those things that I could really, you know, get behind. And, you know, I'm fortunate that the microbial community and now we added immunology, we're so supportive and providing, you know, mentorship. We've had uh, people, you know, donate, people, you know, do lots of things to, uh, to really, uh, help sustain this pro uh, this program and hopefully help it grow. Because I mean, I don't think microbiology and immunology are the only disciplines that we can do. We'd love to expand into things like cancer genetics or other things that you know uh, that require you know just you know a lot of computer based work or really just helping the students learn how to form hypotheses because that's really a lot of what uh, we teach them in graduate school is like how do you form a good hypothesis and how do you test it. And you don't always need to be at the bench to be able to test it. Sometimes it's good enough to actually just teach them how to do that. I, I, I recall when um, I had to do my qualifying exam. My qualifying exam was I had to write something and then I had to stand up and defend it. It wasn't go in the bench mm -hmm. and actually do an experiment. It was an <laughs> old, So if that's the standard that we're holding graduate students to as far as how they're actually learning things, why not teach those skills to these particular mm -hmm. students? And that can be done virtually to give them an advantage and, uh, you know, when they didn't have any leg to stand on before. And as a model moving forward, even, you know, remote work, remote learning, it, this is, this would be another, another part of that. And, and like you said, enabling people who might not be able to travel across the country to an internship for a summer. Maybe the internship that they want isn't going to pay a living wage. How are they going to be able to manage that? Mm -hmm. And very often it's people coming from 
a place of privilege or, you know, really scraping and having to having to give things up to be able to get those opportunities. And so to be able to get that next little step into the field of science that they're interested in, that next little yeah. bit of experience, that's, that's great. And, 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 and very much like the, uh, the copper that persists uh, after uh, the initial uh, encounter with, with maybe one or two bacteria, and it can persist in that environment and, and spread its effect. Uh, so too does getting this many more minds engaged and involved and sort of up to the next tier of really uh, being dedicated to that pursuit. Especially if you've got a, a research project that you've done and you can show like, hey, I haven't just been studying this. I've done some of this work now. Yeah, those, those people aren't turning back. It's, 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 a, it's a good reminder. Yeah, it's a good reminder that science is only as good as the people doing it in a lot of ways. And I think that, um, you know, I, I'm reminded of a story that we talked about on the show a while ago where ornithologists for hundreds of years were white men. And then all of a sudden women started doing ornithology. And then they were like, oh, it turns out female birds also sing. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's just the fact that we all carry these biases that are some sometimes they're they're very um they're they're kind of invisible and sometimes they're not and those biases impact everything that we do including our science and which is why it's so important to have everybody at the table and our science is never going to be good enough unless you have everybody there it's such important yeah. work it's so awesome yeah thank you so much for for leading that effort, for being a part of it, for bringing people together and lifting them up and making that happen. Science will be better because of things that you're doing. Awesome. That's, that, 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 is my, that is my hope. That is truly my hope. So that this inter interview, as much fun as we're having, doesn't go all night long. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up a little bit here. Um, so is there just you know, kind of a take home message or anything uh, about your work that you want our listeners to know anything that we haven't really gone over or just a take home message, something that you're like, this is what people need to hear. Well, I think there's a couple things that I've learned in my laboratory that I think that uh, are, are really important. Um, I think sometimes we look at scientists uh, and, you know, pe the field, people look at scientists and they expect us to be perfect. And even within our own field that we sometimes expect each other to be perfect. Um, but what I, you know, a lot of the hypotheses that we've actually generated, uh, we proved incorrectly. Uh, we proved that they're incorrect. We proved our null hypothesis is true. Mm -hmm. um, and even within the same project of how this compound works to kill different bacteria, it's like, well, we think it does this whoa, it does something completely opposite of what we thought it would be doing. Um, and with that, I think a big lesson there is that you're not defined by your hypothesis, but how you actually learn from it and move forward. Um, and I think that's something that I tell, you know, graduate students, I, I tell uh, trainees, I, I tell myself in the mirror sometimes. Um, but it's one of those things that I think that's like a really – that that gets lost in the shuffle with how we treat science. And, you know, we, we want to always treat it as this is an absolute thing. Well, times change, situations change. And as does, you know, we have to, you know, change our hypothesis with those particular times. Uh, so I, I would say that, you know, you're, you're not defined by your hypothesis, but how you choose to move forward after it. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for speaking us yeah. with us for this interview. Where can people find you online? I know you have a very active Twitter account. Yes, so uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Black Side Blog. Um, you know, I you know it has kind of all my information to my you know faculty page and uh, those things. Um, uh, you know, uh, you can find me through the NSERP uh, website as far as, you know, trying to reach me there as far as 
how uh, ways you can uh, help there. Um, and yeah, that's my, uh, uh, those are kind of the ways you can uh, deal with that. And, um, you know, I think my email is on my website too for, for faculty. So if you have any scientific questions, um, I'm happy to answer them over email. I'm ha ha also happy to answer them in the public domain over Twitter. Because uh, I think some of those scientific discussions out in the open actually make for some of the best science discussions you can have. Yeah, that transparency and that the public questioning and and the inquiry, the process of figuring something out and watching somebody helping somebody figure some something out can be so fun. Yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, Michael, would you like to? Stick around or do you, uh, because we do have more stories to come, but we'll be here probably until about 9.45. I can hang out till then. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. 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 All right. Then everyone, this is This Week in Science. We're so glad that you have joined us. We hope that you really enjoyed this interview with Dr. Michael D.L. Johnson. And if you did enjoy this interview, Please consider supporting TWIST to help us continue to bring you interviews like this and more science every single week. Head over to twist.org, click on our Patreon link, and you can support us at the amount of your choosing. Once a month, you'll be charged. If $10 is good for you, any, anything like that and more, we will thank you by name at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. You know, we really can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. And now it is time for placentas? I don't know, Blair. It's Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a what you got, player? I'm going to make you wait for the placentas. I'm going to talk about moths first. Um, okay. yeah, I know. I know. I just want to make sure I have enough time to talk about the placentas because it's, it's a thing. But uh, first, I want to talk about moths and the evolutionary arms race that is over 65 million years old between bats and moths. There have been a host of evolutionary defenses ever since ultrasonic sensitivity evolved in bats and that is pr particularly pre prevalent and diverse amongst moths so there's there's a bunch of different ways that different types of moths try to get away from the echolocation of bats some shift the frequency of their calls to or some of the bats will shift their frequency of their calls to a spectrum that a moth isn't sensitive to so they don't even know they're echolocating they can sneak up on them uh, other bats have decreased the amplitude of their calls, basically whispering as they echolocate. Shh, you can't hear me, moth. And then um, the moths themselves have started to do things to try to evade these bats. Um, and in particular, I wanted to talk about a type of moth that has found a way to create an acoustic decoy. So how do you create an acoustic decoy? They're not like throwing their voice, <laughs> but what they're doing instead um, is it's almost like uh, throwing a bat off of the scent based on sound with the structure of their wings. So their scales on their thorax are really good sound absorbers. So first of all, that can kind of deafen the sound a little bit. So less echo returns to the to the bat from the moth's body. So this allows the insects to kind of disappear. But this new research, so we've known about that for a while, this new research was all about the scales on moth wings and the, the way that they are structured, they can dissipate sound energy that is used during echolocation. So they basically, they're, they're kind of curly and folded in a way that makes the sound bounce back in a different direction or a different way to confuse the bats. So in some cases they amplify the sound, it's louder and it comes at them in an unexpected direction. And they're like, what is over there? <laughs> then the moth can disappear. Um, so this is all based on their wingtips. And right now Kiki's showing two different types of moths, the hindwing 
decoy and the four wing decoy. So this is uh, two different moth strategies for doing that. Um, so in, in one case, uh, we have this moth that has a, this like long finger kind of coming off of the back of their wing. Um, and so that it allows them to, um, kind of, uh, confuse the shape of the moth. But this other one, this curled wing on the top, kind of closer to the head on, on kind of the fingertips, if you, if they were bat shaped instead of moth shaped, try to paint a picture for our listeners. Um, the, that one is this one that has this new structure that has never really been studied. So this is the one where there's this acoustic tomography and they were able to map it with special software so that they could see exactly how the sound goes back. And so they 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 found that it it just confused the heck out of the bats. They <laughs> they created this image of a moth using sound, and they were able to see which parts produce loud echoes, which parts produce weaker echoes, which parts are invisible based on echolocation. And what you come up with is something that really doesn't look like a bat at all. So it is enough that the bats are kind of like, oh, nothing to see here. <laughs> they can just kind of move along. So, um, yeah, so right now we're projecting the image, which I recognize also to everyone else probably looks a lot more relevant. Uh, I'm told there's red in this picture and that that is where it's especially loud. <laughs> it's it's I, fine. Most of our audience is listening and not yeah. looking at the picture also. So it's just as obvious to them as it is to you what color this is. Sure. So essentially the front of the wing, this initial arc up from the head to the those fake fingertips I was talking about before, um, that wing part is—is is it is, just the wingtip? Is that what yeah? The, it's the, the wing. Tip? It's the wingtip for sure. Okay. But it's um, but it, it's curled over. It's it looks kind over. of like a, a moth or a butterfly who's just having come out of a chrysalis, and yeah. maybe the wings aren't entirely dry, and so they they haven't completely unfurled yet. They're just yeah, kind of curled yeah. in. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so you, that area is really really strong. That, that area creates lots of kind of loud echolocation. And then the rest of the wing kind of fades into nothingness in terms of sound. So it really doesn't make the shape of a moth to a bat. So the bats don't see moth. They just mm -mm. see something that they don't recognize. They haven't learned that shape. That's Absolutely. not Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so uh, essentially this is a new way of kind of cloaking that these that moths have been doing that that scientists have discovered the question is next of course a what can we do with this technology is it helpful i don't know just Ooh, some food for thought cloaking technology will this i mean we've already yeah. got planes with odd angles on their surfaces mm -hmm. that are supposed to be yep yep but Cloakable, then the second question is yeah. will bats evolve to adjust yeah probably mm -hmm. probably <laughs> yeah if you if you told me if like next week you're like yeah so bats and moths are now using lasers on each other yeah like, it wouldn't surprise me i mean they've had 65 million years <laughs> yeah it's, it's a lot of time to do your homework anyway forget about these moths let me talk about seahorse placentas woohoo let's get into it why is the phrase seahorse placenta weird any because, takers because, because Oh, go ahead, Justin. They're uh, in the ocean. They're in the Most ocean. Things, like if ocean stuff is uh, born in eggs. So first of all, they're fish. Seahorses are fish. A lot of people don't realize that. Fish, generally speaking, there's a lot of asterisks on this statement, come from eggs. Right. So why would they have a placenta? Okay. There's another reason that that phrase is weird. Seahorse placenta. Is it because the males carry? Aha, uh -huh, bingo. So nice they are, work. they're one of a very, very select club that where the males carry the babies. So in seahorse copulation, females actually have an ovipositor that looks kind of more like the usual male mating device to deposit since ova depositor, egg depositor, to deposit unfertilized eggs into a seahorse, male seahorse's pouch. The male seahorse then releases sperm into the pouch. And then those eggs are fertilized 
and that male carries those babies as they gestate, as they grow, until they hatch. So this is extremely strange for a bunch of reasons, but the the real one being that this all hap- this is not really I wouldn't consider this an internal process. It's a pouch that is essentially an outcropping of part of their skin on their tail. It's not it's not like a uterus. Like a fanny okay? pack. It's it's like a fanny pack exactly. <laughs> Thank you Justin that is an excellent excellent descriptor for this. It's like a fanny pack. It's outside of the body. So Seawars placenta, insane statement for three reasons. It's a fish, males, and also it's outside of the body wall. So all of those things together make this crazy. So let me it's tell like you It's like a marsupial about. fish. It's like a marsupial fish. Yes. Kanga horse. Yes. So the, <laughs> the issue <laughs> with not laying eggs, if you are a mammal... If you are a shark, a lot of sharks don't lay eggs. Um, If you are a snake or a lizard that reabsorbs your eggs and gives birth to live young, there's a big problem with that. And that is that if you're in an egg, the eggs have gas exchange with the outside world. So they have this opportunity to absorb oxygen and release carbon dioxide through the pores in the shell. But if you give birth to live young, how do you do that? In humans, we have a placenta. It's an organ that connects the mother to her baby. It allows for gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. It's also involved with nutrient exchange. It removes waste. It has a connection to the mother's bloodstream. It's this amazing thing. Not a lot is, I feel like the general public and especially people who haven't grown a placenta in their own body at some point don't understand how complex and beautiful the placenta is and what a crazy thing it is that it provides to the baby. So I'm just throwing that out there. Do a quick Goog if you're not aware of what placentas are up to because it is fascinating. Regardless, I digress. That's how mammals take care of their babies and there's a placenta we're showing on the screen right now probably looks kind of like what you thought a cartoon of a kidney would look like (laughs) but it is its own thing um so then so that's males in sharks a lot of sharks have live birth and a lot of them have really long gestation like 12 months and so they um develop a placenta something akin to a placenta it's not exactly the same as a mammal one but there is an umbilical cord it joins the mother to her babies Some lizards form a similar structure. So it's something that is not totally way off base outside of mammals. But what is weird is, again, this is in a pouch outside of the male's body, just kind of like a a, a skin pouch, skin fanny pack. So in seahorses, we already know, they the males go through lots of weird changes, similar to those seen in mammalian pregnancy in females, related to their blood and all sorts of other things while they're they're growing these babies. And so researchers took seahorses and, who were raising babies in their pouch and they um, they looked at them under a microscope at various stages of pregnancy. First of all, found blood vessels growing inside the pouch. Whoa, very cool. The distance between the father's blood supply and the embryos also, decreased dramatically and continued to decrease as pregnancy went on. That improved efficiency of transport between the father and the embryos, could provide nutrients, could do all sorts of things. And all of these changes that they saw were akin, were kind of analogous to something that you would see in a uterus with a placenta during mammalian pregnancy. So they didn't have a physical structure, but they had the same mechanisms going on inside the pouch through the skin that was like they were turning the lining of the pouch into a placenta. (laughs) So this is wild. We knew nothing about this. This is all new information. There's still a lot to learn. The next step is to kind of look at how the nourishment of these babies works during pregnancy, really mechanically how that works. But for starters, this definitely shows there is morphological Uh, There's a morphological change in the seahorse brood pouch that is 
very similar to what happens in a mammalian placenta. So. Right. It's that, that the, the reconstruction, it's like, this isn't going mm -hmm. to be taken over for a little while. We're going to yeah. remodel for a little bit. Yes. We got to put some new furniture in here mm -hmm. for a bit. We're going to little, little different purpose maybe mm -hmm. than you've been using it for, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you don't need to store your, your, your supplies over there anymore. We're going to put some, we're going to put something else over here. And then, and then babies are born and it goes back to the way it was. Amazing. And then you can actually move all that furniture that got squished in the one corner yes. back to where it was before. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you're a mammalian, um, if you're a mammal that carries babies, those that furniture never moves back. <laughs> Your pelvis has changed forever. It it doesn't move back to the same exact positions, yeah. but I mean, no, it, but your organs you kind of get the general. It put them generally back. Yeah, yeah. the <laughs> organs they can move. The pelvis. You get your bladder sorry. back. There was some light damage in the process. Anyway, um, yeah, Sierra's placentas. I'm blown away. I love it. I can't wait to find out more. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. I mean, really. Yeah, I mean, you had me at seahorse placenta, and mm -hmm. it is it it did not let us down. That was great, Blair. Yep. Okay, Justin, what can we do with a few stories here? You've got some uh, stories to tell, don't you? Yeah, this is uh, researchers at the Translational Health Science and Technology Institute have found evidence that suggests adding salt to the diet can suppress the growth of cancerous tumors. Dot, 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 in mice. So this is one of those mouse studies that I, we should actually look this week or in this next couple of weeks for the morning TV show that's like high sodium diet cures cancer. Doctors uh, have found. But this is They're definitely going to have that on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me next week. Yeah. They love yes. those kind of stories in the opening. <laughs> but this is actually, this is, a, this is a, a pretty interesting. This is published in the journal Science Advances. Uh, they feed tumor afflicted lab mice a high sodium diet and compared tumor growth with mice on a normal diet. Part of the reason is the there's an association with a high sodium diet that leads to inflammation, also high blood pressure and increased risk of heart attack. So if you're trying to avoid heart attacks, don't go on a high sodium diet kind of a thing. But they wanted to look at and, and see what was going on with tumor growth with all of this inflammation and thing that was going on. Uh, they found that mice on the high sodium diet had an increase in uh, bifidobacterium probiotics. That led to an increase in the type of immune cells that attack cancerous tumors. They also found an increased uh, ability to inhibit uh, PD-1 proteins, which have been found to prevent T cells from attacking tumors. So they kind of got rid of the protein that was protecting tumors and the incre uh, increased the amount of uh, immune cells that were there available to attack it. And this was through a probiotic. Well, how does this probiotic getting to tumors? Closer look showed that the high sodium diet made the gut barrier leaky. And having a leakier gut barrier allowed more of the bifidobacteria to move from the gut to the sites where the tumors were located. They also found that once the bifidobacteria made their way to the tumor, crosstalk between the bacteria and the immune cells that were attacking the tumors resulted in more successful attacks. Hmm. This is, this is a coordination on a level of things we have in our bodies that we just don't even realize is, is doing all this heavy lifting, right? So they also uh, found that conducting fecal transplants from mice on high sodium diet to those of a normal diet also improved their ability to fight the tumor growth. But I guess that was just sort of skipping ingestion really at that point. Uh, also, what was interesting, researchers found that instead of a fecal transplant, maybe you could consider eating less salt or more. In this case, yes. more. <laughs> no, no, this is this is high sodium is, is leading to this. High sodium is leaky, right? Yes, is the leaky it which makes is the helping. leaky gut, and then you have the the oh, but the the bacteria get in and they kill the tumor. See, th this is what I was going to say. They, it's, bad, would, this is, they don't kill like... the tumor, but somehow they are communicating in a way that's helping to coordinate the attack and suppressing the thing that would suppress the attack. 
it's a, so it's a, good for cancer, but bad for great. cardiovascular health yeah. and other. Hang stuff. on, mm, but the, hang le on. the leaky gut. That is not something you want generally. It, we don't know <laughs> that though, because this is what we're learning: is that all the things that we think we know, that we, all these assumptions we have. Justin, about, you don't you don't want the word leaky related to anything inside your body. <laughs> More permeable. <laughs> It is more <laughs> permeable. Thank you. There we go. More convenient uh, oh, pathways. Yeah. There's <laughs> a lot of literature out there that actually uh, defines, uh, you know, kind of, so you have like all these different types of bacteria. You have bacteria that are commensals, which is kind of what we think of those good microbes that we have. You have like some that just kind of don't really do anything for us and they're just kind of hitching a ride. You have things that are like pathobionts, things that like are on our skin and if things go wrong then that's when you know they wreak havoc things like c diff we have lots of c diff in us but once we are you know like we clear out some of the microbiome then that's kind of when they go crazy and then you have your very virulent bacteria things like bubonic plague which don't really care they're just gonna they're just there to try and kill you but with the commensal or, or they're, what's or really they're not and that's the thing is, they might not be trying to kill you they're just in the wrong place they're not supposed no. to be in you. They're doing the thing they would normally do. And it's like, oh, this is killing the host. What's wrong yeah. with this host? I'm highly convinced that uh, Yersinia pestis are just evil. They're, 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 <laughs> no, they're just out for blood. Uh, but at least here, there's a lot of literature about uh, different commensals that actually do help prime the immune system. So there's things like Sigmentus filamentous bacteria uh, that help, like, you know, maybe your neutrophil response or, you know, to kind of help you clear, you know, like there's bacteria in your gut that can actually prime you to help clear a respiratory infection. Hmm. Uh, so the connection between microbes in your gut and the rest of your body is actually really, really fascinating. And it, what, I mean, it, it's basically them reprogramming immune cells to do their job more efficiently, or in some cases, not more efficiently. So here it's, it's nice that they're a little bit more efficient in how they're, uh, you know, trying to kill the uh, the cancer. Yeah, and there was there's also uh, there was always this idea that the uh, uh, the leaky gut or the permeable gut uh, was was an uh, an injury uh, situation which allowed for infiltration from the gut into the bloodstream, and then they found motor proteins that were grabbing bacteria and bringing them in. So there's there's a yeah there's a there's a uh, uh, not uh, there, there's some mechanism in there that's like no no we we actually need that to happen uh in certain situations but there's a little bit more to this because the research has also found the opposite to be true <laughs> in a scenario so researchers also found that low sodium diet worked in conjunction uh, with cancer fighting drugs that showed an increased ability to reduce the tumor growth so, so, so the big disclaimer on this thing also is if you're taking a drug treatment, don't go for the high sodium diet. A low sodium diet was actually more effective because the drug interaction was probably on a model that didn't include bifidobacteria suppressing a thing and doing another job. So yeah. you, your drug uh, treatment is taking a different pathway to the solution of reducing the tumor and it prefers a lower sodium environment. So again- or, or the drug pathway is making your gut leaky and letting the bacteria in. Well- <laughs> Could be. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great, like, I don't know if that was seen or studied, right? So, but the, 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 the yes, the entire world of our guts and our microbe interactions and how they affect disease is we're still, we have just started to scratch the surface of this. So yeah. anybody who is interested and in thinking about doing a scientific pursuit, but going, oh gosh, they've already figured out everything. No, <laughs> no, no, no. All of, uh, all of science throughout the history of all science is just a setup for you to make some big discoveries. It's all just been that, that platform for you to actually find the real stuff that we've been, we've been edging towards all of these years. So now I have so many questions about people with IBD, celiac, colitis, you yes. know, how that yes. actually plays a role into uh, some of the questions that they were asking in that paper. Yeah. Which part of the spectrum do they fall under? Do they yeah, need like yeah. maybe you have IBD, but you're not going to get cancer. Right. Exactly. 
you know, at least not cancer in other places. The colon cancer is probably, yeah, well, I guess what kind of cancer were they looking at? What kind of uh, tumors? These were, were uh, I think, melanoma tumors. Uh, okay. is there, yeah. Um, colon cancer and colorectal cancer, by the way, I think we need to rename those for specific groups because there is, there has also, this is a whole other thing, but there's like this uh, still a resistance for people in different groups and uh, men, especially to, to seek treatment or speak about colorectal cancers. Um, just fun. Just go and Google famous people who have uh, had colorectal cancer. And if it's, you know, if you've got your conservative uncle who doesn't want to uh, deal with it, Ronald Reagan, right? And, and the African-American community, Jackie Robinson. You know, huh. you, yeah. Uh, you got somebody who's like, uh, not really in it. Yep. Audrey Hepburn. Like, just you go find that, that fame and rename it the Audrey Hepburn. Does it rename it the just Ronald Reagan? Just call it lower syndrome. tummy what, cancer. It's your tummy. <laughs> lower tummy. Lower yeah. tummy. Fanny pack. No, I already used fanny pack in the show. Okay. Uh, other mystery that's being used, uh, uh, being delved into, dark energy. Okay, so dark energy, mysterious force in the universe that's causing it to accelerate. This is that thing that's uh, 68% of the energy in the universe. You know, 27% is dark matter. And then whatever's left over, that little bit is all the stuff we see and interact with. So dark energy is this huge mystery. This is a, it may, we may have discovered it uh, a while ago and just not figured it out. The, the Xenon 1T experiment deep below Italy's Apennine Mountains was a study that was designed uh, to detect dark matter. And yeah, we had some results and stuff, but there was these weird hiccups, this sort of noise in the system that they kept trying to get rid of because it didn't really, it was, it was like an interference or something wasn't working right. And uh now they're looking at it and modeling it, and they had all these different things that it could have been. I know this sort of, it's sort of by eliminating all of the things that they, as uh, all the hypotheses, there were a bunch of null hypotheses that took place. I think it's this. I think it's these, uh, this, this uh, energy, these, what are they called? Uh, the axions or whatever it is, that these little particles created by the sun that could have been doing the thing. By eliminating all of these and ruling them out of their models, kind of the thing that was left was maybe that's dark energy. Maybe that's uh, the dark energy being created by the magnetic field of the sun. And it's still kind of early because we've known about, well, this is the quote from Dr. Sunny uh, Vagnozzi, Cambridge's Calvi Institute for Cosmology. Despite both components being invisible, dark energy and dark matter, we know more about dark matter since its existence was suggested as early as the 1920s well, dark energy wasn't even discovered until 1998. So large-scale experiments, experiments like Xenon 1T have been designed to directly detect dark matter by searching for signs of dark matter hitting ordinary matter. But dark energy is even more elusive. And then this is Dr. Lucia Vicinelli. Uh, These sorts of excesses are often flukes, but once in a while they can lead to fundamental discoveries. We explored a model in which this signal could be attributed to dark energy rather than dark matter. The experiment was originally devised to detect. And, and you know, this is one of those, it, I love accidental science. It is some <laughs> of my favorite yeah. types of science where you've, you've designed an experiment and here's what you're designed, you've designed it for. And here's the thing you're going to learn from it. And you know this going in and it's just whether or not this was the right approach. And then you find something completely different. <laughs> then your experiment found a, uh, caught uh, a, a parameter of nature in this case that you weren't even ex uh, expecting. So they still have to keep looking into this to make sure this was not a fluke. They need to sort of recreate the experiment or maybe refine it to, to try it again. Uh, but very exciting that we may have we may have accidentally discovered the most elusive and predominant uh, energy in the universe. Because if they found it there, then that would apply, uh, imply that it's being released by the magnetic fields and forces of stars all over the universe and other large active bodies, right? So uh -huh. it could solve that big problem. Okay. Very cool.
And then the last story I've got for the evening, uh, this is new research, also University of Cambridge, suggests that autistic individuals are less likely to identify as heterosexual and more likely to identify with a diverse range of sexual orientations, uh, more so than non-autistic individuals. This, of course, has great implications for how we teach and how we uh, instruct healthcare work workers to approach. So the findings counter what were previous assumptions that autistic individuals were just uninterested in sexual romantic relationships. This is, uh, again, mm -hmm. assumptions made by general public, healthcare workers, uh, psychology, wh whatever field. These things persist. They, you know, sort of like your, what was it, the ornithologists? Somebody, <laughs> somebody said something. And it be got into a textbook or got into a lecture. And now everybody who's been taught thinks this way. Turns right. out, once they actually did a large scale survey and started asking people, absolutely not true. <laughs> uh, largest study to date on these topics, the team at the Autism Research Center used anonymous self-report study. And the survey say to study the sexual activity, sexual orientation, and sexual health of autistic adults. Overall, they had about... Uh, 1,100 to 1,200 autistic and 1,200 non-autistic adolescents and adults. This is huge age range, 16 to 90, uh, provided information about sexual activity. Results showed majority of autistic adults, 70% uh, autistic males, 76% of autistic females engage in sexual activity. They do so to a lesser degree than non-autistic peers, uh, which was just up to 89% for both uh, male and female non-autistic. Non but still, that's, you know, that's uh, much higher than the assumptions had been. Contrast previous findings, the study also found there were no difference in likelihood of contracting STIs or at the age at which participants first engage in sexual activity between autistic and non-autistic individuals. In addition, they found the, uh, they were approximately, autistic adults were approximately eight times more likely to identify as asexual and other sexuality compared to non-autistic peers. There were sex differences within this. Autistic males were three and a half more times to identify as bisexual than non-autistic males, whereas females were three times more likely to identify as homosexual than uh, the non-autistic uh, group. This is uh, uh, Professor Simon Baron Cohn, Director of Autism Research Center, who, have, if that name, uh, Simon Baron Cohn, sounds familiar? Yes, he has been a guest on the show before. Uh, he says the new study is an important example of applied health research where, with policy relevance to health and social care services. Uh, and then the uh, lead researcher of the study, Elizabeth Weir, goes on to say, it's particularly important that health care providers and educators use language that is affirming accepting of all sexual orientations of gender identities when providing sexual education, sexual health screening checks to autistic and non-autistic people alike. But large emphasis on uh, refocusing the assumptions people make about people without having any of the data to back it up. Um, speaking of not <laughs> having the data to back it up, I have two uh, ideas about this that I don't have data for. Um, but one is that um, I, would, I would be willing to guess that historically research about people with autism was done on and not with those individuals, right? And so this is probably something where historically there was an assumption about the sexual activities of people with autism because it was just from the observer, right? Nobody asked. Nobody asked. Yeah. There was an, there was an, an understanding yeah. for a long time that like people, uh, people with autism that are, that are verbal, there were assumptions that there was less verbal capability with people that, mm -hmm. that are perfectly verbal because there are huge assumptions that are made anyway. So that's one thing. But the other thing I was thinking is that like, this could be a weird byproduct of the fact that until recently, and in some places mm. still people with autism and other learning differences are separated from kind of like neurotypical learners in, in early ages. Right. So does that then remove them from some of the weird social pressure that neurotypical people receive <laughs> that prevent them from identifying as bisexual, it's, asexual? Oh, gosh, homosexual? it's all the 
It's all interesting <laughs> questions. I love that. I, was, I love that there. take. I do love that. I was take. really thinking that second take as well. It, it, it's so interesting, you know, having kids and kind of hearing them talk about yeah. uh, just the fluidity of how they talk about gender and, and sex right now. And it's just like, it's one of those things that how they identify are things that when I was their age, I didn't ever talk about or ever consider. And there's just so much more openness about that with them right now and less pressure on their peers to, you know, conform, uh, to conform to one thing or another. So your point as far as like taking them out of that school makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's I, I would be more likely to say that, like, the the ratios that we see in the people with autism are probably closer to what gen pop would be if people weren't <laughs> like all the peer pressure like yeah, yeah. influence yeah. in the way that we are because let's yeah. face it most people are some sort of bisexual <laughs> even people who say they're heterosexual they're not like totally heterosexual my, my right? favorite so my <laughs> favorite my favorite uh, uh uh joke on this is actually a, a seinfeld uh bit where he's talking about the uh homophobia being a fear of salesmanship it's really like if if you got walked into the showroom, it's like, yeah, have you ever held a hand with a man? Well, no, I never have. Well, you want to try it? I'm just here in the showroom. Just just hold a man by the hand. Just go for a little walk back and forth. Oh, you know, it's, it actually isn't as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> it's, it's like a fear of that, like, actually, maybe uh, maybe I would like that. And and then there's because of all of the, the social pressures, uh, I would have to reject this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's Very interesting. Question. Yeah. That's an interesting study, Justin. Thank you. And I've got just a couple of studies for the very end of the show here. I wanted to let you know that biofuel might be getting really hot. And by hot, I mean created by nuclear radiation. What? Yeah. Engineers at Lancaster University have published in Communications Chemistry, and they have proposed a process to generate a biofuel additive. So it'll be a sustainable additive called Solcatol, and it would use waste from biochemical and nuclear industries. So the idea would be to use nuclear waste radiation and the heat that comes from that to do the processing, to power the processing for this biochemical biofuel creation. So it would be taking waste products from two dirty industries and using them to create sustainable biofuels out of biofilm... waste organic products. <laughs> <laughs> would the biofilm be radioactive as well? Or... I think that's the that's the big question. No. <laughs> the idea is that the, the fuel would not be this additive that would be created, the Solcatol would not be radioactive, that it would be the heat from the radiation that would lead to the process that would take place, but that the energy could be derived from that. And the idea is that the, the manufacturer of this biofuel could be integrated at nuclear waste sites or on the way Solcatol. out. Solcatol is what they call it, yes. Okay. Yeah. So pretty fun <laughs> stuff there. It's maybe, you know, taking dirty industries and hopefully turning them into something a little bit more positive and sustainable in the yeah, end. Yeah, if we can if if it if it turns out all of this uh this nuclear waste that we're storing in these leaky compounds uh, around the country can actually be used to for something positive, that would be great news. Would be great. Yeah. Right? Oh, it's not just going into a hole in the ground. It's also continuing to do work. Hey, who knew? Yes. Um, and then the littlest, teeniest, tiniest robots have been created. It's a winged microchip. And it's it flies. Oh, perfect. Oh, this no. This is what we needed. This is what we needed. <laughs> <laughs> smaller than an ant these oh, no. researchers publishing in uh this last week's issue of nature from northwestern university have basically put wings on microchips and given them the power of flight using the biological principles after watching 
petaled seeds fall to the ground from trees. Mm-hmm. Imagining devices that could be used, tossed out into the environment with sensors to measure and find out. Yeah, that's what, what it's happening. for. To yeah. measure. Exactly. <laughs> we now welcome our new robot overlords. Yes. <laughs> and they will litter the ground. But they won't because these engineers are aware of the issues of pollution and the fact that they would be creating these devices to potentially track air pollution, air quality, um, oil spills, all sorts fires of fires in the fires. Yeah. Yeah. Where they could be dropped and be used to gather information and monitor. Um they are biodegradable. They have been created with materials that are, have been used medically and have been developed as biodegradable polymers. So eventually they would simply melt away. So there Does that a... help your attitude, Blair, when it comes well, to my little tiny is, winged robots? Will they be melted away faster than they will be hacked? <laughs> This is a great question. I do not know the answer to this that's question. That's what I'm worried about. I do love the I do love the idea of being able to do sort of uh, large scale monitoring, data collection kind of a thing. That sounds amazing. There's a uh, story I didn't bring uh, tonight though. That's uh, sort of along this line where they're trying to create a uh, a sort of remote control device to, for drug delivery. That is made from a patient's uh, plasma mm, so very that cool. it would actually be. Yeah. So if you can actually con- make That's the construction, rough. somebody's it won't get rejected and it can be absorbed into all of its pieces at the end of it, like uh, a used blood cell. If this if this can be biodegradable to the degree which it would mimic what's in nature and degradable there, I'm still like picturing like, OK, so the wings biodegrade. And it's some part of this chip, though, or something like it's got to persist, doesn't it? Or but if not, and, if and they can actually the truly biodegrade right. it in the way that nature wants it biodegrade, not the way that we think about it, as in, right, oh, right, I don't the see human the biodegradable as opposed to <laughs> yeah. everything else. Exactly. Yes, but they're working on that, so it's good to know that there are researchers working on these robots that could be deployed into the environment, these sensor devices, that they're not just throw, potentially throwing them out there and causing more litter and pollution and damage to the environment, that they are thinking about how to do it in a way that works with the environment. Fingers crossed, you know, more research. There's always more questions and more research to be done. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, um, researchers discovered how we make associative memories. There are a whole new group of cells that they just discovered in the brain, in the memory center of the brain, and they are basically powered by dopamine. So every time you make an association between like a smell of coffee and that test that you were studying for, um, what's happening is dopamine is actually involved and is triggering, stimulating these cells within your, uh, your brain to make an association, the researchers did not even think that dopamine would be involved in the memory circuits because dopamine is supposed to be the reward circuit. What the Mm -hmm. heck? Mm -hmm. Dopamine is involved in things that are important for learning and survival. So I am they want to reward you. Your brain's rewarding you. Yes. It it rewards, it, it, it rewards you, but it also is making a note. It's saying, this is important. This is different. Watch out. This the, the dopamine is like a little tag that says, okay, this is a thing. And now we know it's involved in memory. So all those people who are like, I'm going on a dopamine fast. Really? Do you really want to do that? I don't know. Watch they won't remember it. Out. Yeah, they'll forget <laughs> that they're on the diet quick. Yeah. <laughs> but this is, I mean, this is always fascinating to me uh, when when you're talking about the, the brain kiki. Because it, it always it always informs me that all the things that I think I am as a human being who's doing this conscious effort, conscious effort to exist, there's this other part of the brain that's forcing me to do it. Like, yeah. I'll forget to eat. Uh, but, but the brain is like, no, your stomach is now going to grumble. And I'm going to pull these levers that make this dumb 
this dumb ape survive whether yep, the brain it knows how the to curtain, or not. Justin. Yeah. <laughs> There's a brain back there. The brain, Have yeah, we done the, it? The, never mind the brain behind it. We've the done it. We've talked about lots of science. Oh, gosh. oh, we talked about so much science. It's been an amazing couple of hours. This has been so great. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Johnson, for joining us this evening and continuing the conversation with us. Yeah. It's been so great getting to speak with you. It's been really fun. It's really been fun. And you you have done the twist trifecta of almost uh, he hasn't done after the, show yet. Comment, oh, that's right. <laughs> that's a that's a quadfecta. That's the after show. <laughs> but the uh, the intro part, uh, yes. uh, then then the interview, and then the after part contributions as well. So that's that's uh, not not every guest does goes that to that length to participate. Hat trick. So thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. I want to say thank you to people who help with the show. Fada, thank you so much for your help with show notes and with social media. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And I would like to say thank you to Gord and Arnlor and for all the other moderators who keep our chat rooms safe and happy places to be and talk about science and learn new things. And Rachel, thank you so much for your assistance and for editing this podcast. And I do want to say thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralph P. Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Addie, Ali Coffin, Maddie Perrin, Garv Sharma, Shu Brew, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Dale Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Ardiam, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Hey Arizona, support Aaron Lieberman for governor, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Mallory Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, EO, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luth, and Steve, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Pete, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show, we are going to have Bill Shutt as our guest. He's going to be talking about his new book, Pump. I can't wait for that. Yeah, we will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, 5 a.m. Central European time, <laughs> broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels. And from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe uh, while you lay in a field and watch seeds float to the ground. Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, you can get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org, and you can sign up for our newsletter. Yeah, you can also keep your eyes uh Peeled on twist.org for calendar pre-orders for 2022 <gasps> coming very soon. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at Blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will definitely be mashed up and stuffed into a 3D printer, and we won't recognize what comes out the other end. Oh, God. We might like how it tastes. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you can also uh, hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes due in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 
This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. God, the Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science 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 And that is the show. We're still live. Oops, I thought I hit turned it off, but I didn't. It's still going. More music for everyone. If you listen to the radio, David, the first assumption more correct. Now we're going to get tagged by YouTube for having other people's <laughs> music. Oh, no. <laughs> it's so funny because I have permission from Jake to use the song, but it's like you have to get go through a process to get it white You have to appeal like every time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge pain in the I'm butt. Sick. I'm, uh, enough, I'm multitasking with some tacky glue for the Wait, calendar. You, yeah, you have to approve what the song that is our theme song. We have to approve to get it used through the YouTube filters or something. Right. So YouTube has automatic their algorithms. Okay, find songs and be like, "Hey, you're playing music. Are... What are you doing?" So I saw something interesting. <laughs> on and i don't know if it was a, a youtube thing uh where there was this little thing saying like this has been approved music and it wrote it onto the screen and i don't know if that was like some weird thing that youtube's adding where you can be like here's the song and it's always okay 
uh, to add to the thing. But that's interesting. I didn't know. I don't know. I don't know any of the stuff that happens behind the curtain on that. YouTube does all sorts of things yeah. in there. Yeah. They Different editions. Do. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much. I don't want to keep you up any later. It's I, 10 o'clock. Yeah. There, I, 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 while I do have to run, I, I have to ask one question for yes. um, Blair before I Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, in your awesome theme song, uh-huh. um, you it mentioned things except for giant pandas. And squirrels, yes. And squirrels. So I, I have to ask what the story behind the giant pandas is because I'm well known in my uh, in my household for being someone that has a certain level of disdain for pandas. Well, you go <laughs> so first. Wondering... Huh? You go first. No, I, I just, you know, ever since I saw that video of somebody, you know, the panda trading its baby for an apple, and I'm just oh. like, are you scared? <laughs> Like, do you want to survive as a species? How hard is it to get y'all to like? It's just unbelievable. It's hard to get you to um, breathe. So, you can't like, eat this food. Is, this is this but, is like but why do you have them around? Because they're cute. I'm like seriously. Boo. This is exactly <laughs> Blair's point. Yeah. This is exact almost exactly it. It's, this is listen, the thing they that's trying they not are, to survive. They are. Yeah. Perhaps mm-hmm. the only species that is alive that is not extinct. Because of humans. Yeah. Yeah. They're absolutely. an evolutionary dead end and they zap so much money from other <laughs> conservation efforts. We're offering you a panda as a gift. Nobody, I don't want that. I don't want that. <laughs> well, so here's here's a fun factoid. Did you know that every panda in a zoo in the United States is owned by the country of China? Yes. And that zoo, even if they breed pandas and a new panda is born. That panda now belongs to China. And so a zoo has to pay a million, last time I checked, this could be different, a million dollars a year as a lease per panda. So even when pandas are these giant kind of uh, magnet and people come to check out the pandas and it's a huge draw and they are allowed to like raise, raise all these conservation dollars. It is very rarely fiscally a net gain. Okay. So, so, I, so I lived in Memphis and what was the weirdest thing about that zoo is they had, I mean, it was a great zoo, but they had like a couple pandas and you know, they had these viewing windows to like look at the pandas and everybody crowded around the windows and basically it's a panda sitting with its legs wide open just munching on bamboo which mm-hmm. or sleeping and i'm just like yeah i'll just stand back here yep. <laughs> correct so I'm, I'm, I'm with you blair I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm with you I, I i i i can i i did not agree with this at all to begin with but blair has convinced me over the years she has. She switched me to an, uh, an a, being not a, a panda enthusiast. However, the more we learn however, about them, the worse they are as an animal. <laughs> it's the problem. Is they're bad at, at having Blair, we're, we're, bad. We're, we're besties now. Yeah. Blair, <laughs> you and me. You and me. We, right. we, we cool. But wait a sec, Michael. What is this story about a panda trading its baby for an oh, apple? Oh, there's a video of it. And I've not panda, heard this. Oh, man. And basically, the panda is like holding his baby. Oh, do, are you finding the video? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll see if I can okay. find it. But it's exactly know, but, what yeah. it sounds like. Panda <laughs> trade baby. <laughs> oh gosh. For apple, it's like the first search that comes up there in the YouTube. There's no okay. hesitation. Just like, sure, go ahead. <laughs> like, didn't even flinch. Didn't even flinch. Oh, thank you. I like apples. I don't <laughs> care about my baby. I'm a bad mom. Uh-uh. Oh, no. uh, they don't want it. They always have a stomach ache because they have their own gut bacteria. They get lost. They can't find their way home in the wild. It's just a mess. It's just a mess. Oh, now my internet says no. Yeah, you're a... Uh... See if I can redo that. There we go. There we go. Yeah, well, here's an apple. Can I have the baby? Yeah, okay. Oh, that just falls. <laughs> the baby. 
Just literally drops the baby. Drops the baby. Go ahead, Jay. Not even like gives it up, like literally just completely drops the baby. No look of surprise. No look oh. of like, oh, where did my baby go? Just it's gone. <laughs> I have an apple. <laughs> yeah, don't care at oh, all. No. Okay, but Blair, I will disagree with you still to this day about squirrels. I think they're the most Oh my god, they're terrible. First of all, most of the squirrels in the United States are invasive. So they're an invasive species. So that's a huge problem. And well, one like, bit they, her, so she has a she she's she's got a a grudge. <laughs> Listen, they <laughs> unfortunately it's our fault. Like we've turned them into these like extremely habituated monsters to humans, and so the, yeah, they get way too close. They're grabby. They're too smart. They're like they like oh, too they're thinking six animal. steps ahead. Ooh. Maybe Did squirrels, you know if like humans a can't handle movement things. movement to try and eradicate squirrels, and all we did was just make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like, that you can basically, work. if you kill the squirrel, and it was like your civic duty to do, though, you can, like, trade in a, a tail to get money, and they, like, kept shifting tails to, like, the government, and it just had this huge <sighs> bat, bat of tails, and they couldn't pay out, and it just starts smelling bad. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> if you look up, like, Attempted squirrel eradication in the United. It has a yeah. very interesting history. So every wow. every electricity company, every like Ugh. utility company has a squirrel budget because oh, it's one of the number this one literally reasons happened for, this for, year. Yeah, for power outages. This literally happened this year at the job place. Uh, the power went out, and we were waiting, you know, hours and hours and hours for the power to get put back on. And the word back from. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric was squirrel got in there. Yeah, that was filled it with nuts, probably. Right, and, we're, and I was and I was, asked, I was like, how how wow how did like how was there a thing that was a, you know a squirrel got in yeah. all the time? Yeah, it's they have a squirrel squirrels. budget. It's they have a oh. squirrel budget. It's they. I think it's they spend more money on squirrels than on like natural disasters. Wow, most wow. utility companies like it's insane. Um, yeah, they suck. Squirrels are the worst. <laughs> Well, you all, it's been super fun, uh, but I, thank I, you I, I so think much. I should take off right now. Um, thanks for having me on the show. I really had a great time. Please talking come back. It was yeah, super fun. It was really fun talking with you. Really great. Thank you. Talk to us much. again about was... copper or. There'll be know. more stories, I promise. Yeah, or any of it. Awesome. I love it. Uh, all right. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Have a great night. Thank you. Don't mind me. I'm just. Nah. And yes, Atlas oh, wow. Obscura has an awesome. I found an um, amazing image for U.S. squirrel eradication. Apparently, the United States in 1918 got children to kill squirrels. Yes. And That's in this comic, it says, comic. kill the squirrels. And there's a woman with a nice wide brimmed hat carrying poison barley. And she says, children, we must kill the squirrels to save food, but use poisons carefully. Yeah. What could oh, go wrong? Yeah. <laughs> and then there's like uh, another part of it is uh, like a five-star restaurant, hotel, California. And there are two squirrels, Mr. And Mrs. Squirrel having dinner. And they're asking for some nice young barley sprouts for their uh, dinner. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to the bar, the poison yeah, bar. I like squirrels too. I think that it was. I also so, think they're neat. It smart. was Squirrel Week. Agile. They called it. They called it Squirrel Week. And they got children to do their part for Uncle Sam. Yeah. Go destroy their foe, the Squirrel Army. Listen, as okay. long as we're sharing my unpopular opinions, let me just make a sweeping one. Uh, nature <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Care. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm learning so many things. Atlas Obscura is fantastic. Oh, I love it. Okay, the this Squirrel Week, they fed the children. Oh, wait, it was announced in 1918 at a meeting of the state's horticultural commissioners as they lunched on grain-fed gophers. Oh gosh. Good, good. They Don't had gophers. The drop. I they had gophers for lunch. It was a very and, different time. 
1918, they ate gophers for lunch, and they uh, it said, the San Francisco Chronicle reported, liberal portions of beef were served to those who did not like gopher meat. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Well, at least everyone was happy. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, here's my thing. Uh, nature doesn't care if something's cute. <laughs> no, nature doesn't care. If it's invasive, it's a nuisance. <laughs> Well, and then, I'm sorry. Then, and I'm sorry then, about that. That's true for squirrels. That's true for stray cats. Mm -hmm. Then I I'm see sorry. all of humanity in the squirrel. And also, there, there was a study a out this last week, tree? though. There was a study this last week that Never. said that, that squirrels have personalities like people. Yeah. All the more reason not to trust them. <laughs> Oh, I didn't say trust the squirrels. I didn't say uh, trust. Well, that's my big thing about but, squirrels. They're uh, untrustworthy. Dear. I'm not just impressed by them. The like squirrels. we've all seen squirrels running up trees, running across these branches, doing all this. I've never seen a squirrel fall out of a tree. Never uh, seen it. There's happen. videos online that are pretty. Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. What I've seen them. It's probably CGI. I don't think no. squirrels. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, oh, squirrels. But you still support people having cats, Blair? Indoors. Mm -hmm. Indoors only. All right. So should we have an outdoor cat eradication policy in this country? Uh, unpopular opinion time. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, it's Blair's <laughs> nodding. She's not going to say yeah. the words, so the audio uh, won't go out. There's no audio of the after show. Uh, yeah, no, yes, there absolutely is. yes. Uh, cats need to be rescued and homed and spayed and neutered. Well, and if spayed, that is not spayed, possible, spayed or neutered, you you can't do both. <laughs> spayed or neutered, and I'm you talking but about you can, the plural cats. Yeah, you can't just home all cats, though. No, so there there is an unfortunate piece to this, but like, yeah, you have to make a decision: is it going to be stray cats or is it going to be lizards, frogs, and birds? And uh, for the whole world, basically, because this is a problem on every continent. Yeah. Except for yeah, it's, there. So there's the show on Netflix, Cat People, and they're talking about uh, there are a couple of people who go out into the community and into their community and they capture feral stray cats. They take them in, get them spayed and neutered, but then they return them back to the place where they were trapped. And the reason right. that they the reason that they give is that it's you know no kill so that the cats mm -hmm. aren't killed, and then also they are maintaining the social hierarchy within that local cat community so that there's no like big empty hole in the community that causes a bunch of cat fights as they try to assert dominance and and find their new territories as a result of the loss of an individual. Yeah, so that's that's a trap, neuter, release, or TNR program, and that's like yeah. really common in a lot of places. Yeah. The problem yeah. is that you have you have to wait for cat for lifetimes, yeah, to finish for uh, the massive destruction to stop. Right. So we're talking, place. you yeah, spade yeah, trap, neuter, release, and then you wait fifteen years. Yeah. Which a lot can happen to an ecosystem in 15 mm. years if you have the species like eradicating small birds. It's yeah. pr it's pretty it's pretty rough. It's a great point, Blair. Mm -hmm. I don't Sorry. know if everybody Sorry. thinks. No, it's good. I love cats. I really, really love cats, and I want to save all the cats. But I also really, really love birds, and I love the wild native animals and. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is, like, what are you releasing them into? You're releasing them into a life of of being a stray cat, which is not great. A life of cat them. crime. It's, I mean, so I almost brought to the show, but I didn't want to, like, start a whole uproar on the internet about it because I know it's a hot button issue. But there was a study that came out um, a couple weeks ago where they looked at, I think it was in Australia, the average life span of a stray cat. And the average lifespan of a stray cat is actually under a year. And it's because oh, they're being hit by cars. 
mm -hmm. getting sick. They're getting attacked by other animals and other cats. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not a fun life to be a stray cat. It's not great. Yeah. The thing I still guess I don't understand <laughs> about that <laughs> then, if that was true, is where are all the cats coming from? Most if of them aren't neutered. If That's people, the problem. Oh, most, most aren't? Really? Yeah. Okay. yeah most pets. of them are not. Yeah. There's oh. a huge number of outdoor cats that are pets that are also intact. Okay. Hmm. Because it's up to local governments to require it. And then there's no way to enforce it. Because if the cat, like you see somebody walking a dog, you're like, where's that dog's license? But if it's a cat out in the world without a collar on, how do you know if that's somebody's cat or if that's a stray cat? You don't know. You don't know where to send the bill to if you see so a cat. So you have plausible cat. deniability. 100%. To do eradication. Yeah. Sorry. I, I actually know a lot about this because <laughs> I'm in a Facebook group about this. Oh, Oh wow! Wow, that um, is an issue for you then. If you chose chose to be in a Facebook group, I like lizards and frogs and birds, and I like local wildlife, and I want to preserve ecosystems. And cats are a big problem. Yeah. How is it? Did we all? Because I know we switched some of the stuff that we say at the end of the show. Did we also switch some of the the opinions the thing, that we the have? Opinions of we, the hosts. <laughs> like how much change no. went on? And, Justin, I've thought this forever. Blair's the anti-cat one. Who knew? I'm not anti-cat. I am anti-outdoor cat in as an invasive species, unrestrained. Okay. Okay. It's a very specific thing. It is specific and it's important. I mean, in the last two days alone, I have come across in my neighborhood cats without collars, young male cats that were obviously unneutered mm -hmm. intact you know, you know just like just walking around and it, there's a lot of them and it's it's mm -hmm. shocking to me in a you know in an urban environment where you think people are like hip <laughs> to the yeah. to, but everyone's like no my cat's gotta be free and it's like well, no 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 your cat needs to be indoors or in a in a a cat porch a catio or on a or on a leash but so i yeah. think this is the this is the weird um dichotomy of this particular issue that's just wild is that people who love animals love animals but don't know a lot about ecology yeah will feed raccoons will feed yeah. squirrels will feed stray cats yeah because they love animals and i totally get that but there is a huge um deficit in understanding as to what that does for yeah. you know the raccoons and the squirrels obviously it completely changes their foraging strategies and messes up their whole function in the ecosystem and can eventually get them killed so that sucks but also um yeah this the feeding stray cats thing i get it like people are like i love animals there's this cat that's really has an affinity for me that responds to me that that comes to me meowing for food of course you want to feed that cat and you have an emotional connection to that cat. But I'm saying trap that cat, take it to the vet. Spay See if it has a chip. It, and chip then, it yeah, if it, it doesn't and take yeah. it home and keep it home. Yep. Please. <laughs> Suddenly I'm trapping cats in the neighborhood, so, going so and that, getting them spayed or neutered and uh, just returning them to the, getting them chipped and returning them to the neighborhood. Their owners are posting on next door saying, did somebody do something to my cat? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. No. <laughs> Which, so, if so your cat the, was home, the, we would know it was your cat. <laughs> uh, this is where I would have to interject into your scenario, Blair, and say that if you've taken this cat home, you mm -hmm. may be introducing Toxoplasma gondii to yourself and your other six, seven, eight cats. Uh, you, yeah, the, that's the, definitely possible. If you have those six, seven, eight other cats, you probably have Toxoplasma gondii already because mm -hmm. those, where did those Except cats come from in the our, first place? Our chat room, who definitely doesn't. Exactly. <laughs> you guys look, know. Japanese mossy frog. Oh, oh wow. there's a frog you in the calendar. You got like a whole next level thing going on there, Blair. She does. It's going to be an awesome calendar. It's done. I'm scanning it in tomorrow. Yes. Woohoo! So, I cannot Rachel, wait if you're listening, um, I'm going to plop these into the calendar and it's going to be up to you to set the holidays and then we can buy them. 
Awesome. Does that sound good, Kiki? Yeah, if we can, uh, yeah, I guess if you send a link write her to an email, yeah, yeah, or just yeah, just send her the link to the uh, the mm -hmm. Google spreadsheet that had the holidays in it from before. Is that what yep. you need? Yep. To double check that. Yeah, yeah. So basically, yeah. So she can double check the ones that are in the calendar currently because I usually start by copying the previous year. So um, check that, and then in the Google sheet, um, whenever possible, I've written like changes every year or like first Thursday in January or um, same date every year or whatever for as many of them as I can. Um, but they just have to be double checked. All right, so I poked it our 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 in law in the chat room. It was, it was fun. I actually do not have Toxo got tested for it. Okay. This is That's something awesome. that, this is something that, uh, I, I didn't know I, you test for it. I you can. Yeah. Or that, it was, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that it was the common test or whatever. I proposed yeah. that we do this on the show before. Uh, you know, like how you had people going out and getting, uh, vaccinations, uh, to show people like, Hey, you can get vaccinated and it's not a big deal and it's fine. We should do that on the show. We should all go get tested for Toxo and yeah. encourage our audience to do the same. I probably have it. <laughs> <laughs> she lived in the zoo with the animals. I also cared for cats. Um, yeah. And like, this is something that I didn't know until oh, probably my late 20s. I didn't really understand. Like, this is the thing is like, you can know a lot about animals and be an animal lover and not know that stray cats are this huge issue. It's just not talked about because it's really unpopular. Anywhere but this show. Because we're more than happy to be unpopular. <laughs> That's right. Doesn't, doesn't bother us in the least. What's important Let's is be being unpopular. right. Unpopular. <laughs> uh, the truth can hurt a little. It's I wonder fine. why people don't like it when people talk about this. This is why. <laughs> I wish I wish there was a way to to really truly explain the issue without looking like you've lost all compassion <laughs> cuz it's just it always gets twisted that way you know yeah anyway yeah i mean i think you know everyone has a different perspective and they're looking at things from that perspective and it's you know it takes that awareness to be able to step back and look at things from a different perspective to be able to go oh i just really like animals and i oh there's this whole ecological impact i had no mm -hmm. idea yeah it's a do tough i thing. care about the ecological impact or do i do i just care about me and my cat that has to go outside it's oh, Aztec like... Gold. Thank you. We appreciate you. Oh, what happened? Oh. Someone um, said, look, it's very nice. I appreciate oh, it. I appreciate very... you too. Um, yeah, Thank I think you. nature doesn't care when things die. That's how nature works. Yeah. <laughs> there are winners and losers. And the problem is mm -hmm. that we put we put this this tiny predator with claws and teeth and hunting <laughs> skills yeah. in a place cats. that doesn't have that. You know what I also think would be very interesting to do is before somebody takes on a pet, they'd be given a one sheet, a one page mm -hmm. on the proclivity of disease <laughs> and the cost of treating those diseases and uh, it, it, that the, uh, of that pet. Like that yeah. breed, the breed of dog that you've picked out because you think it's cute. Mm -hmm. uh, if you learn that 70% well, of them, pet owners should do that. No, but nobody does. And it's not being offered I anywhere. Do. Like, if, like, <laughs> well, but if you go into like the SPCA to adopt a pet or, mm -hmm. or anywhere that you're getting your animal from, oh, thanks, you should Frank be Grimm. handed a one sheet page showing that, you know, 80% uh, of this breed gets a uh, hip dysplasia or a major cancer thing or a thing by the time it's like uh, six years. Whatever so the thing there's is, there's two like, problems with get that, that data, already. the comparative data between the breeds. So if you're getting a pet from your kid, you know that you you're going to also spend more, if you're going to keep it for the kid to be like ten years old. You might also have to put the college fund aside <laughs> to keep the thing alive. Like <laughs> these are important things that just don't get 
like present it to the general public. Yeah. yeah. So Justin, problem number one with that though is that most animals that come out of the SPCA or in whatever place uh, like mixed. that, yeah, 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 they're not purebred. But I can tell you that when you adopt a dog from most shelters, including the SPCA, you are required to take a class. I wasn't ever. Yeah, but, that's okay. that's a newer thing. That's like that yeah. started in like the late '90s, early 2000s. But I think I, yeah, it must have been late 2000s because I uh, the early last 2000s. Dog I, got I, I did SBCA it in was around 2001 or two, 2000 okay. maybe. So I did so, mine at the SF SPCA in 2000, 2001, 2001. Um, and we were required. You're required to like sign up for the class. They're not going to chase you down if you don't go. Uh -huh. But you were required to sign up for the class. No and I had to go. It was like a six-week course. What? On Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That like can't be training. everywhere. That must San be Francisco a San Francisco SPCA thing. is like, they are something else. They they do that for cats, too. They have like, okay. they have training classes. They're not going to yeah. let you just take a pet. No. I think that's a that's city, awesome. that city thing. I don't think that's Maybe. happening other places. Okay. Yeah. I thought that was an ASPCA thing. I don't think it's all of them. I think it's, I think it really is. It's the city and maybe they don't have, they, they have a lot of people who want pets. And so they want to make sure that the people who want them are really going to put in the work to take care of them. Yeah. Um, yeah I, it definitely doesn't happen all over the place. Oh, our and Lore had a long course. Oof. Oh, wow. Adopting That's locally fun. from a small charity. Ooh, Leafy Sea Dragon. Yeah. It's so Wait. shiny. Um, a male having a baby, potentially. Woohoo. Oh, here's the last one. I'm almost done. You want to see them all? Yeah. I want to see these pictures. All right. Well, anyway. Um, yeah, so I'll have... I'll be able to do this. Plop this into the template very soon but they're all done Woohoo! so uh pre-order link can go up soon huh yes right? it is on yeah. my list of tasks to do okay cool. <laughs> cool, cool i started writing down lists of tasks to do to ask a to-do list of lists <laughs> yeah <laughs> I have a list of lists I need to make. Yeah. yeah. I need to make. Okay, put that on your to-do list. Make yeah. list of lists. Make a list of lists. To do. Oh gosh. I have I have, I have oh, a giant gosh. whiteboard. Oh, look at this. Oh my god. <laughs> With all of my things I need to do. Oh my god, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I sat up. down and started I started writing down my lists of lists and now I'm like yeah, I'm scared. That's too much. <laughs> Maybe I need to clean house and get some things finished so I can put other things on the lists. Well, I saw a tweet the other day that was like, there's no rules. Put wake up on your to-do list. Great. Oh, you got something success. done. Put brush your teeth on there. Oh my God, you're on fire. <laughs> yes. Like, you know what? You're right. Yeah. All right, so here's this one. I'm very proud of the shading on this one. Blop. Ooh, I like that one. That's yeah. really cool. Hammerhead. Okay, so then we have, you saw the sea dragon. And I have to like put weight on these. You saw the tawny frog mouth. You saw the emu. You saw the Japanese mossy frog. I didn't see the. Did I see the emu? Yeah. Did you show them all off. Oh yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, I sh I showed this one a minute ago. Oh yeah, I like that one. Yeah. The background on that one's the nice. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um. Here's a chuckwalla. Ooh. I don't know what that is. I mean, is I that Australian? Looking thing. No, it's in the Mojave Desert. Oh. Yes. Um, here is my velvet ant, which is actually, fun fact, a type of wasp. Ooh. Oh. Yeah, you don't want to get stung by that sucker. Gaurav Sharma in the uh, chat room is asking, will 2022 be COVID free? No. No, absolutely not. There's my guinea pig. <laughs> it will not. <laughs> I think so. 
Oh, guinea pig. So, if you say 2023, we can go maybe. Go to 2020 too soon. It's not going away. Oh, I like the snail. It's going away. It's not going away. Nah. Saber toothed. I have read. Ooh, I like the saber tooth. That's pretty. I have read opinions by experts uh, <laughs> that it's going to be endemic, completely endemic, probably in six months. So what oh, that's going to mean is just like the flu shot kind of stuff. But we're just going to. That's great. But by that Part point in time, hopefully, at least here in the United States, the majority of people could be vaccinated or have been infected. And so there will be some underlying immunity that will keep people from ending up in the hospital. Oh, Love man. Twitch asks, are there any microbes on the calendar? Yes. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> Please don't swab it. <laughs> okay. The whole well, thing. Can we with swab the, one of the copies, but if you get the, one of the originals, if you're a patron, please don't swab it. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I don't want you to own my DNA. Thank you. Ah. Oh, hey, if you're interested in owning any of Blair's DNA, the cover. Yay. What are some of the original artwork? All right. That's right. You can get Blair's original artwork by being a patron at what? $50 a month? Yeah, I think it's $50 a month. And yeah. um, these ones, I'm probably. We'll see if I can price some that are reasonable, but I want to put them in shadow boxes because this is like a different yeah. texture. And I want, I, I think it would look That'd weird be cool. behind a, a flush glass, but I think it would look really cool in a shadow box. In a shadow yeah. box. Neat. Also like the paint is like really 3D. So I, I think it would be, it would be better to do that. Cool. That's the plan. <laughs> Copper plate the Copper calendar, plate. says Paul. Mm -hmm. Aaron Laura says autoclave. Copper calendar. I like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just throw the calendars in the instant pot before sending them in the mail. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, don't lick the calendar. Don't lick it. Okay. Okay. Don't lick it. <sighs> I'm going to put a heavy book on these overnight. You're smashing them? Yeah. Are they smashing? Yes. Smashing, darling. Smashing. Smashing, smashing, smashing. baby. Yes. There we go. Money, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, Paul Disney. <laughs> Your wall needs more Blair art. Awesome. Oh, yes, yes. I'm up to date on the comments. <laughs> You've been doing things. It's hard to keep track of all the things. Yeah. You don't want a clone of me, Grouchy Gamer. <laughs> Trust me, you don't. Um, she could a clone of Blair that would oh come boy. and yell at you about stray cats and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and pandas. <Yeah>. True. <laughs> uh, 2022, the calendar can come to you. It will be put in the mail and i hope that people recognize that the u.s postal service is not what it once was and may, <laughs> may take longer to be delivered yeah we'll have to put and a like want... guaranteed for christmas date in like november 1st <laughs> yeah it's gonna be like okay so we're gonna start selling them beginning of october yeah just just order them now <laughs> get in there now and we'll mail Maybe them a month yeah, hopefully, I, hopefully we can get them ordered before the end of October so that they can be mailed out before Thanksgiving. Hopefully, that would be great. Or if I could mail them out, I could use Thanksgiving weekend to do a packaging party, mm -hmm. which really means trying to cajole my child into helping me put labels <laughs> on mailers. <laughs> Come on, I wish Kai. I could help. I'm so far away. That would be super fun. Fly me up. That's right. Come on up here. Fly me up and I'll, uh, I, I'll Like right down now, there. I am honestly waiting for the vaccine for Kai. Like I'm just like. Okay. It, we're so close. We're so close. And his friend's having a birthday party this weekend. And he and like his other friend who are like, they're, they're like the tree. They're like. 
the three musketeers, Kai and his two other friends. And the two other friends, though, they're kind of potted up a little bit more closely. And they're uh-huh. going to do a sleepover after the oh, birthday geez. party. And Kai's like, I want to go to the sleepover. And I'm like, not yet. And he's like, yeah. ah, he's so mad at me. And I'm like, yeah. I, 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 it's, it's just it, it's so because so Yeah, close. like, do you go like, okay, well, what do ev- everyone who's going to be there, what do their parents do for a living? And who have they been hanging out with? And how close? And are they vaccinated? And oh, it's a lot of questions. Yeah. Oh, boy. So close. Yeah. Well, I know um, so in California, they're setting up vaccination sites for five to 11 year olds. Like they're working on the infrastructure. They're starting- so, yeah. So we are very close. I think they're, they're actually, you know, props to California. They're setting up the sites before the approval comes out so that the day approvals happen. They can start giving shots. So this was, and this was a thing, as as we can all sort of recall in the way back machine of uh, mm-hmm. yesterday. Uh, we had vaccines, yeah, and we didn't have a distribution, logistical anything mm-hmm. set up for it. So they, we like lost vaccine from uh-huh. waste uh, expiration because yeah. There was nothing in place. Uh, uh, the vaccine actually got faster than got there faster than the thing of just basic yeah. logistical setup. Very happy to to know that now that yeah. they are uh, getting ahead of this thing. That's fantastic. well, and, and at least you know, in the county that I work in, um, not only are they setting up the sites ahead of time, but they're um, they've pulled specifically. Um, staff that have experience working with children to design and plan out a process so that it's not the same as for the adults because the adults you know you say wait in the line okay take a jab okay um go sit in that chair for 15 minutes but for like a six-year-old that's tough so instead Mm -hmm. they're talking about like doing a story time, explaining what's going to happen to them mm-hmm. before they get the jab. And then after the jab, having a specific activity or story or game or craft or something that they are occupied by for the 15 minute waiting period. So, and so they're, they're like going about it really smart, which is that it, it's cool. so funny that you're saying this. Cause my first jab was from a pediatric nurse and she was sort of, Keeping me occupied, talking to them. Oh, yeah, so how's your day been going? It's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. like, yeah. And then I'm waiting for the shot, and it was like she's already putting the band aid thing over. I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, I didn't even notice it. You're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I know it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm really impressed with how um, it seems like they're being really deliberate. Yeah. It's nice. Deliberate is good. I, mm-hmm. I'm glad to hear someplace is deliberate. I am concerned Oregon is not going to be as deliberate. Just come for yeah. a visit. Maybe you come here to do the yeah, I know. I'm like, maybe and I bring to... him. And then... Let's go to California, Kai. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, yeah, it's I have a feeling it's going to be especially here in Portland is just going to be crowded immediately. I bet like everybody's going to be like trying to vie for appointments and get their kids vaccinated as soon as possible. I get in there. I'm going to do what I can. Yes. Yeah. How long is it going to take before the COVID vaccine becomes part of the suite of shots that babies get? Right. Soon. Yeah. I would guess soon. I mean, now there's, you yeah. know, while, while this is all but happening, all they were get. suggesting mm-hmm. pregnant women get the shot. So the antibodies are passed to the yeah. baby. So cool. It's amazing. And like, so my friend was um, pregnant during the vaccine rollout. She got her first shot while she was still pregnant. She gave birth just a couple weeks early, but she kind of missed the window to get her second shot because of that. Mm. So she had to delay for a little bit. Wait. But then she got her second shot. And the great news is not only is it passed through when you're carrying the baby, but passed through breast milk. Yep. Yep. And potentially because she waited longer, it's possible that she has even higher mm-hmm. immunity. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that weird finding that they found. That, mm-hmm. uh, that delaying yeah. it a little bit longer potentially 
makes it work a little bit more. Something that somebody was, uh, a few immunologists were writing about in on Twitter recently is that the Delta variant, the reason that it's having breakthrough, that it that it's breaking through vaccinated people so much more often is that its rate of reproduction is so high that what happens is if you if you've been like a, a while since your your vac vaccination, then you don't have antibodies necessarily circulating in your blood, but maybe you've got B cells and T cells, but That's they right. need to be activated. And so normally an infection is going to reproduce at a rate that's like, oh, there's reproduction. And then the B cells and T cells, they get in there and they they get and they can clear it all up. But because Delta reproduces so fast, it just poof, overloads so, the immune system. It overloads the system. You get sick even though you're vaccinated. But then it uh, you get better fast because finally your immune response kicks in and, and kicks its butt. So it's not cool. necessarily like actually mutating away from the vaccine. It's just oh, that's great. It's making lots and the delta is making lots and lots of babies too fast. No, but that's kind of awesome. That's great yeah. to hear. Yeah. So it's it's not a mutation that is like as like it. Yeah, it's not avoiding ev evading what our body yeah. knows. It it's has it's, it it's dynamic. It's kind of it. What is it? It's um kinetics is what they call it hmm. which means solvable by another shot yes yeah so if you were to get a booster shot what that'll do is put antibodies back into your blood and circulating and so you'd be able to pretty much fight it off right away nice. yeah delta has not evolved to behave not yet though oh. behave oh, behave yeah all right friends I'm I, I'm realizing that having to get up in the morning for my Kai's school is making me a very tired person. So I need to go to sleep now. <laughs> for your Kai? <laughs> for my Kai. I don't understand this like parenting thing where you have to get up. I yeah. mean, he has to go to school. Why can't he get up and walk his butt there? Great question. I mean, maybe in because, a few years. Because, uh, because, uh, <laughs> It's a, a time has passed in your generation that takes your kid to school. When I was his age, <laughs> I did take my butt to school and get up mm -hmm. on my own in the morning. Things have changed. Things that was have my changed. Job when I was my a son, kid. I know. Today, Kai, we got home from school. He's like, I want to walk down, down the road and go to this pastry shop and get myself a pastry. On your own out there in the world? Why? Yeah. How could? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. like, mm -mm, nope. If you were with a friend, I would let you, but you're so, not with a friend. So I'm not going to yeah. let you do it by yourself. And he's like, what? Someone's just going to kidnap me off the street. And I'm like, uh -huh. maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, I can't. Hey. So this is, this is also, but it's also progressed through the ages. Now I can remember, uh, at the, there's the high school, which I uh, was living near. So I drove by it a lot. When I was a kid in the morning, it was a it was flocks of bicycles uh, going into the into the school. Uh, in the modern era, the it's been a line of cars uh -huh. still dropping off high school age. I would never have allowed my parents to drop me off at a high school, let alone the junior high school. It would have been embarrassing to be dropped off by that, your parents. Yeah, well, I grew would up, have to be my high school away. was out in the country, and it was a whole, like, okay. I mean, when I was driving, I had it down to exactly 12 minutes door to door. But, you know, it was a 15-minute drive from my house, drive from my house to school. And before I had a driver's license, my parents had to drive me to school. There was no me getting up in the morning and riding a bike that far. No. Yeah, different yeah. scenario. It's a different, it's our, a different our, scenario. I just, I the, town, the town I grew up in, you, every kid had a bike by the time they were eight oh, years yeah. old and they were on their own to transport anywhere. Yeah. But not with a baritone saxophone, which is what my <laughs> high school experience was. Yes. Even with a... See, this is the thing. The just drop it to the back changes. of the bicycle. If you don't want to... I, I you think you guys are underestimating how big the case is. I know. 
How big yeah, a that's what handlebars are for. You learn to balance. I know, I know. You learn to balance. Justin, that's it's cool. like it's. I think it's seven feet wide. That's fine if you dedicate it to your art. It gives you a Carson platform to people. put your coffee on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I I uh, I got driven to high school, but I often got dropped off like a couple blocks away. But that, for more reason than any other reason, was that um, uh, there was a giant line of cars. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also the other thing is my school, my high school started at seven thirty in the morning, <sighs> and so I was not going to take the extra time to take the bus in the morning. Absolutely no. not. It was it was a five minute drive or a forty five minute bus ride. So. Easy, easy choice. Yeah. Also, yeah. two-hour parking and street cleaning because San Francisco streets, so no place to park the car once I could drive. Yes. So all those things. All those reasons and why. Or why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many scenarios. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's uh, it's tough out there. It's tough out there for a kid these days. It is. That's why we must helicopter coddle them. <laughs> must we? <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. So, so I am in the land right now, by the way, though. Uh, where... Oh, those kids walk to school by themselves every day. People oh, walking sure. to school, no, no. free education. And they're clogged. Like... Is that the right place? No. <laughs> you, no clogs. I'm kidding. But this is the land the where prams are left outside of restaurants with babies in them. and But you're not <laughs> supposed to do it if the temperature is below 10 degrees below freezing. Five degrees below freezing, babies in a pram outside is perfectly acceptable. Seven Wait, degrees baby below in the pr I missed the part where the it, baby yes, is still the in the pram. Baby, is baby still in, in the pram. The pram. <laughs> <laughs> and it's eight degrees below freezing. Yeah. Perfectly acceptable. Yeah, I know. Stuff that... You I mean, make never mind... Never Make mind just it. baby in the pram out, left outside the cafe. That alone, whatever the weather, oh seems like the wrong thing to do. In Denmark, that's social norm. That's Sparta is what that is. <laughs> you're, you're, uh, you're making sure you have the most robust children, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, they're not going to survive, you know, nine no, degrees below working. freezing outdoors. Yeah. Uh, then really, they're not going to make do, it. They the didn't rest want of the it way. enough. They didn't want it. I did that once with Kai. No. Well, it would have been somebody else's baby. <laughs> <laughs> What's the hesitation there? Who is was on there? Kai? No, no, no. It was somebody. It was definitely somebody else's baby. I left outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not mine. That would never have happened. Some other person's child. Perfectly mm -hmm. acceptable. No, we had it was in Japan and we had a massive stroller. It was it, it was an American stroller and Japan everything is much much smaller and uh we went into an establishment and I couldn't I couldn't fit his stroller inside and he was asleep. So I put it right outside the window where I could see it and I just, I left him I left see, him outside. So, so I I am <laughs> nervous. I'm nervous when, like, like, what? <laughs> when you go somewhere with a kid and it's like no strollers beyond this point, and you got to pick the kid up and carry them yeah. and leave the stroller. I'm worried about this. Like at Disneyland is this. Uh -huh. All the yeah. I'm nervous about just leaving the stroller unattended. <laughs> right? Like somebody might look and say, hey, that's a nice stroller. I think that's my stroller now. Like I'm more nervous about that. Let alone uh, wouldn't they be more likely to Having a it? baby still in it. I feel like the baby's a deterrent. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Like, oh, that's like, I hope so. I've already yeah. got enough kids. It's like, yeah. yeah, what am I gonna do with this baby? I don't want it. <laughs> Dave Daddy's Shorty is saying in the Discord chat is saying that uh their firstborn they had out in the snow every day in Copenhagen. Yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah. it's just social norm here, and it's the mm -hmm. it's a thing that I will never get used to. No. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Never get used to it. Anyway. Are you allowed to ride a bike and eat ice cream at the same time? Of course. How else would you eat ice cream? Yes. <laughs> Until somebody with an apple turns up. And then you're just like, oh. <laughs> no, I like that. 
apples. Okay. Well, for me, yeah, it's not apples. <laughs> it's like glass. There's of probably there's probably a YouTube video of people uh, on their iPhone dropping babies. <laughs> oh, so so let's not put ourselves too far uh, ahead of the panda in this regard. Yeah. <sighs> we're we're you know we're we're you know racing the panda to obscurity. But we've, time, we've developed you're gonna have... modern medicine is the difference. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> That's the difference. It's <laughs> we we've developed a band-aid for our stupidity. <laughs> 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 they just sit there and take it. <sighs> I also always love it how it's it is we it is definitely we uh, in the general sense of humanity. Some smart humans elsewhere have done something. If it was just left to me. Yeah, we would not have any of this. <laughs> <laughs> but we would have a bus van and some great art and yeah. cool cool stories to tell. Yeah. Yes. All right, say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good, good night, night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining again, and we will see you next week for more This Week in Science. Have a wonderful week. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Stay curious. <laughs>